steal for number 10. I mean, if we're gonna defend Pedro the Cruel, he was obliged to defend his throne against his father's uh, 10 illegitimate sons. On the other hand, they wouldn't have had so much more support from the people than the king himself if Pedro hadn't outraged his people with arbitrary killings, drama, and rules, as well as the pretty cheap treatment of his wife Blanche, the sister of the king of France. His father, Alfonso, had ditched his wife, Pedro's mom, Maria of Portugal, for his mistress once Maria had produced their son. Exiled away from court, Pedro grew up listening to his mother's hatred for his father, yet when he took the throne, he did an almost exact rinse and repeat. Pedro publicly marries Blanche, despite already having secretly wed one of his mistresses, and he abandoned and imprisoned her very shortly after. Basically, if someone looked sideways at him, Pedro had them killed. He inaugurated his reign in 1350 by killing supporters of his half-brothers, and also had his father's mistress killed for his mother. He was said to have killed a man for looking at him wrong way, and burned a woman alive for rejecting his advances. Pedro's new son-in-law, Edward the Black, got blessed with a large gem that he had obtained by robbing and killing a guest in his own house. He also put a hit out on Blanche in the end, and she died via crossbow to the eye. And of course, needless to say, Pedro killed as many of his own half-brothers as he could get his hands on, primarily through various forms of deceit. On to number 9, which is Charles of Navarre, who can also be called the Double Crosser's Double Crosser. See, Charles came from a branch of French royalty that had renounced its claim to the throne, but clearly Charles did not share that sentiment. He is crowned in 1349 and was driven by revenge and a disproportionate sense of entitlement, quickly earning himself the nickname Charles the Bad, as he attempted to expend Navarre's territory into France and Spain via schemes, plot, and deception. Ultimately, he failed and ended up marginalized and alone. In the words of historian Barbara Touchman, Charles was volatile, intelligent, charming, violent, cunning as a fox, ambitious as Lucifer, and more truly than Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. His only constancy was hate. One of Charles' first targets was King Jean II's favorite minister, whom he had killed by thugs. Over the next three decades of the Hundred Year War, as France contested with England for control over territory on the continent, Charles changed sides so quickly and so often that it made everyone's head spin, and making contradictory deals with each side of a conflict at the same time. He attempted one coup and twice tried to poison the king in like a real life Game of Thrones fashion. And trust me, there's a lot of old nobility stories like this one. So if you're interested in hearing more of them, I recommend you take a moment to subscribe to The Hive. Edward III is on our countdown at number 8, and he pulled a total King David. He sent his homie, Earls of Salisbury, to go fight wars in foreign countries so he could go try to bang the Earl's wife on the sly. However, the Countess refused the King's slick idea, but Edward didn't accept that answer and returned after dark. He tells the valets to quote, nothing must interfere with what he was going to do on pain of death. Contemporary accounts from the time, of which there are five parts, detail how the Countess was left in an absolutely horrific state. And by the time her husband returns, she's fallen into a deep depression and admits to her husband what has happened. The Earl goes into a blind rage, understandably, and goes straight to Edward, who was holding court at the time. In front of dozens of witnesses, the Earl confronts his once friend, saying, You have villainously dishonored me and thrown me in the dung, and continues to tell Edward that his actions were so disgusting and inhuman that he could no longer live in the same country with the monstrous king and then just left England forever. As for the Countess, Alice, all we know of her. Her fate is that the Earl made sure she had an independent income and was returned to her family's care before he left. You learn this story young. It's number seven, King John, aka the Magna Carta King, and one of the worst, if not the worst, King of England. John's offenses are almost too long to list. Even before he was king, the bugger was on some BS. When his older brother Richard the Lionheart was away on a crusade, John attempted to seize the throne by plotting with the King of France, Philip Augustus. Ironically, all those years later, when John is finally king, he starts his reign with the greatest dominion in Europe, England, large parts of Wales and Ireland, also Normandy, Brittany, Anjou, and Aquitaine. Yet within five years, he had lost all, almost all three continental territories to Philip Augustus. This loss of continental inheritance was an embarrassment, and John was determined to win it back. Unfortunately, he was not competent at warfare, and the attempts dragged on and drained the bank accounts. To quote Magna Carta.com, to raise the massive armies and fleet this enterprise would require, he wrung un President sums of money from England. Taxes were suddenly demanded on an almost annual basis. Nobles were charged gargantuan sums to inherit their lands, and the lands of the church were seized, and the 
Jews were imprisoned and tormented until they agreed to pay extra. John's reign saw the greatest financial exploitation of England since the Norman Conquest. In May of 1215, six months after the French whipped his butt, the people of England rebelled and seized London. With the capital held against him, the kings forced to negotiate and obliged to make concessions. The Magna Carta is signed. Then he had it annulled, and then everyone rebelled again, and then John died, and the barons were still rebelling. The end. Next up is William the Conqueror, and he's number six. Before we called him William the Conqueror, he was actually William the Bastard. Like something out of a movie, his nobleman father Robert came across his tanner mother washing clothes by the river and falls head over heels for her. As a result, the royal heir was not technically royal heir material, but don't let Robert or William hear you say that. Between the two, anyone who ever made fun of William's mother was killed and usually pretty brutally. An example is when the villagers of Alisson hung tanning hides in the trees to mock William's mother's status. William stormed the castle, captured 32 defenders, and had their hands and feet cut off. William, a duke far removed from royal lineage, didn't think too much about England until 1051, when the childless king Edward the Confessor made a truly bizarre decision. He chose William to be his heir. Then, seconds from death, in 1066, he revoked it. William decided, no, I'm getting what I was promised. However, England was in a full-blown crisis of succession for years until William defeated Harold II at the Battles of Hastings and became the new king of England. In wake of his victory, William ordered the harrying of the north. In order for the English population to understand its new state of affairs, he sent his men to the north to kill unmasked and pillage stocks. This also made it easier to fulfill his promise of giving the land to his loyal followers. He then imposed new laws, raised taxes, and introduced harsh punishments against those who stepped out of line. The people of England were infuriated by William's new laws, and a series of revolts sprung up north of the country. In response, William and his armies attacked the northern villages, killing everyone in sight as well as the livestock and burning down barns. The lack of livestock led to starvation and disease for what rebels had survived, and the countryside started to reek of corpses. The total death toll, 10,000 people. Up the tower we go for number five, it's Richard III. Richard was never meant to be king, and the malign monarch only landed the job in 1483 because his brother, his brother Edward's children, were deemed too illegitimate for the role. With the support of the Duke of Buckingham, a great campaign promising to improve royal court management, and a stout disapproving of his brother's rampant public adultery, Richard seemed to have potential. But it's kind of hard to praise and look past the two nephews disappearing, however. In August of 1483, the supposed soon to be crowned King Edward and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewberry were sent to the Tower of London to await Edward's alleged coronation. But his coronation never came, and one day they just disappear. The prince's uncle and would-be king has long since been blamed for their disappearances and probable deaths. He had the most to gain, after all. Richard was also doing everything in his power to prevent the lineage going back to them in the first place, such as planning a marriage between Joanna of Portugal and Manuel, Duke of Beja. When that doesn't work, he tries offering up his niece Elizabeth, who at the time, rumors emerged that Richard was planning to marry himself. The room, this rumor more than possibly drove some to side with Richard's only remaining competition for the throne, Henry Tudor, the same man who defeats and kills Richard at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. On to number four, we have Siva Tapolk the Accursed. Now, damn, that's a heavy name, but it's one well earned. I'll be more than honest, as usual, it's actually quite hard to judge if the medieval nobility of, of Kivan Ru were necessarily good or evil, as we know very little about them. And what we do know is word of mouth stories that survive for centuries before finally being chronicled. So we've all played the kids game telephone, I don't have to tell you how easily word of mouth stories can be converted and contorted. Siva Polk, the son of Vladimir the Grey who baptized Rus to Christianity, certainly had the worst publicity possible documented. He's infamous for the death of his three brothers, Boris Gleb and Svivoslav. Siva Polk's reign was a relatively short one, from 1015 to 1019 because brother he hadn't gotten to, Yaroslav the Wise, took action against him. Then Prince of Novogod, Yaroslav defeated his brother, causing him to flee to Poland where his father-in-law was based. With his help, Sivopolk returned to defeat Yaroslav, causing him to flee back to the Novogod. It became a back and forth, taking turns driving each other away, and it was only in 1019 that Yaroslav won. Siva died at age 29, traveling back through Poland. Number three is Christian the Tyrant. His most notorious act was the Stockholm bloodbath of 1520, when after a three-day coronation feast, he beheaded 82 nobles in the Swedish capital after promising them amnesty in return for intel. Up until this point, everything had been going his way. He had reunited the Kalmar Union under his rule, taking control of trade in the Baltic Sea, and married the sister of Charles the Holy Roman Emperor. 
emperor, joining the powerful Habsburg family. But as said by history professor Lars Vittelsgaard, Christian gained a lot of enemies in a very short time at the end of 1520. To quote, the bloodbath was a game changer. Partly it led to a rebellion in Sweden at the time when he didn't have any money left to pay for troops. Partly it was because the Danish nobility began to fear that they would see the same fate and lose their heads. In Denmark, Christian II had carried through a modernization program, limiting the power of nobility and strengthening his power as king. And when has the upper class ever liked having their sense of entitlement towards power tampered with? When Sweden started to break loose from the Kalmar Union, the Danish nobility lost patience, forcing Christian from the throne, driving him into exile, and replacing him with his uncle. Not every ruler is ruling over a kingdom. Number two is John and the White Company. John Hawkwood led the White Company Knights Band that tormented the countryside of France, Italy, and Spain in the 14th century. We've done quite a few videos on this channel that explain how knights are kind of like labor or bodyguards for hire when there isn't some war or inquisition going on. Because medieval aristocrats like to disband their armies the moment they no longer need their services. During those times, the men would band up and ride out. As a result, hardened soldiers often found themselves at loose ends and many miles from their homelands. Since medieval armies fed and supplied themselves by pillaging farms and towns as they went, the mercenaries knew that was efficient, free, and easy for them to accomplish. So they continued in this practice. They roamed the countryside, robbing, violating people, and kidnapping random wealthy hostages for ransom. Of course, they were available for hire, but local landowners were more likely to pay them to simply go away. This is also why chivalry was invented, a code of behaviors and rules to govern these knights to stop their overall rampant and sociopathic behavior. Although Hawkwood, who in retirement would set himself up to be a respectable citizen in Florence, was known for his more insatiable greed than his brutality, and thrived in this time as a freelance knight, he was the leader of a band that carried out the Robert Geneva kill order in Sania. And when two of his men were fighting over who would get to take a nun, he simply pulled a King Solomon and cut her in half. Problem solved. It's last, but that doesn't mean it's the least. Number one is the Vipers of Milan. Bernardo and Galeazzo Visconti jointly ruled Lombardy in what's modern day Italy. And their joint rule really is a testament for how this family really did do everything together. Everything. They succeeded for throne when they killed their older brother by stabbing him and their uncle Lucinio was killed by his wife. A plan she concocted while in the midst of a group intercourse get together on a riverboat. Good thing for her, one of her multiple male partners was Galezio because she could just pop her head up and tell him the plans right then and there, call that triple tasking. Bernardo, the more ferocious of the two when it came to things that weren't adulterous, such as being in a state of perpetual war with the Pope, who tried to issue a bull of excommunication against him and Bernardo simply responded by forcing the messenger to literally eat it, including the silk cord and the seals of lead that bound it. Bernardo's lusts, by contrast, were unbounded. Has he ever heard the expression about not blaming the messenger. And speaking of Bernardo, watch out Nick Cannon because while he wasn't a riverboat share sash kind of guy, the dozens upon dozens of illegitimate offspring by his various mistresses outnumbered even the 17 children he somehow fathered with his very long suffering wife. Seriously, check out this guy's wiki page, it's the craziest list I have ever seen. Their most demented action, however, was the Quest Amira together. It's a 40 day torment method handbook that they wrote that would be used and distributed for wide, wide public use usage, and it's the origin of plenty horrific methods that we saw used throughout the times. At number 10, royal enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no. My guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, Conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. 
At number nine, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse, was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number eight, Mumia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number seven, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number six, eternal youth. I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many, many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number five, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed, and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous, and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs, and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. 
which for all openeth pores of a man's body maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number four, prankster king. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons patronizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm I'm not funny. I'll leave. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you 
have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you have a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's... Horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted. 
nor seem. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman, he is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here, and one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old, she can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert, they viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. At number three, Evil Empress. This next Empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one-two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part-time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe Cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, 
what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember. He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning Coffee This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7. Party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming dynasty in the early 1500s. Now lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready, they're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed, they were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role. 
role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo, you couldn't find a more romantic place. Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC. His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word, philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kinda just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also 
so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We have At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well-organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip-flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. At number 9, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army 
through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Cameron, and chains his brother Askari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. Before I carry on with the rest of the video, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and maybe consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far. At number eight, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? At number seven, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of Daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was the only male heir left to inherit. So on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. At number six, so to an ox. Now Jahangir was emperor, but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure, while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal, and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediments, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taksali Gate. Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. At number five, the horse and his boy. On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, and interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth, and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There's a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shafavid Shah, and it was traveling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first first and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. At number four, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal. Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but 
you will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, whilst giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number three, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military-minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. You would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. At number two, staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was kill Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zang. What made their deaths so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles, and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farooq Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments, and historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non-Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remarkable Remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female, she's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, 
finally Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number 8, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. Pirate Queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones Locker with a legendary frog. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clew Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella the First. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant 
to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number 3, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen. I get it. But she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number 2, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father, Henry VIII, ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Number 10. What a drag. Bachelor number one, what would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number 9. Let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. 
Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry, and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number 8. Cashback King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. Number 7. Terrible Ivan He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number 6. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number 5. Nothing Left Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear-wheeling visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S-word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I am for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4. Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti-revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Rosepierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3. All My Friends Are Dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night of the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies and what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? 
Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number two, average height for the time. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1. Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes through their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy creeps me out, man. Whoa! Number 10. Girl Troubles Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg was a kind and loving mother, so long as you were a boy. Unfortunately for the royal mom, she had a great difficulty giving birth to a male heir. So when her daughter Christina was born, Maria proclaimed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Eleonora often called her a monster. Oh yeah, and she did try to kill her on several occasions. Nothing says mental stability like blaming your daughter for being a daughter, and not more like a son, because the male dominated patriarchy that is royal society has no effect on this, right? Number 9. Eyes on Irene Irene was born into nobility and worked her way up the royal hierarchy. So, why is Irene on this list? That's because she's probably the worst mother ever. When her son Constantine grew into adulthood, he made efforts to sideline his mother and challenge her position as a ruler. Irene, feeling some angry mom energy, retaliated in probably the worst way. In 797, Irene organized the capture of her son, and when he tried to escape, ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Constantine would later die of his injuries. Listen, I've had my fair share of minutes clocked out in the timeout corner. You can ask any one of my teachers, they'll tell you. And maybe even a few times today I should be put in the timeout corner too. But holy shit, mom, eye gouging? And that, I ain't that bad. Sheesh. Number 8. No cake for you. Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France, and for good reason. To make a long story short, she was part of the upper class nobility who benefited from the poor and overworked. When in a time of economic ruin, she still found a way to live a life of excess, while literally everyone else suffered. Spending all of France's money on completely ridiculous items, even by Lady Gaga standards, she jokingly became known as Madame Deficit. Eventually, she would be executed in the revolution. The expression, let them eat cake, was most likely not said by her or by anyone. But regardless if it was, it's a statement to show the complete disconnect and ignorance the nobility had when understanding just how bad things were for the working class. They most likely didn't care either. People were starving and putting heads on pikes. Do you really think they had time for cake, your highness? Oh, to be as beautiful and ignorant as an 18th century queen. Number 7. Lovers touch. Some couples flourish, others fizzle out. Some keep their privacy, and others like to make out in the hallways, right in front of everyone. Yeah, you know the ones. It's always by a classroom you have to walk by, or it's by your locker. Joanna of Castile leans more towards awkward locker makeouts. It's speculated that she may have had some form of mental illness. After her mother fell ill, she was reported not to be eating or sleeping, which doesn't sound that bad, actually. She was also a very envious person who oftentimes expressed her distaste for her husband's mistresses, reportedly attacking one on occasion, which again, doesn't sound that bad. And when her husband died of illness, she kept very close to the man's body and traveled over 600 kilometers with it, where he was to be buried, where she would often open the casket and embrace the cadaver and kiss him. 
Oh, okay, that's where the unholiness is, gotcha. I know medical knowledge wasn't great, but if your husband died of an illness, you couldn't seriously think that kissing him was a good idea. This is like the third royal I've come across that has a fixation on corpses. Sometimes you just gotta let the dead be dead, man. Number six, who are you gonna call? Queen Maria I of Portugal might have actually been insane. And no, not like, come on down to my local car dealership, these prices are insane. More like the Joker on a magic white powder that shan't be named just in case. I don't want to make YouTube big angie. She was known for ranting and raving, screaming that she had been damned. Perhaps it was Phantoms of the Night demonizing the poor soul. In attempts to cure her madness, such advanced scientific treatments like bloodletting and enemas were tried in order to cure her. The enema kind of makes sense. Maybe she's a little blocked up. It happens. I don't know. There were other attempts to cure her of her madness, but nothing seemed to work. While her first years in power were good, no one was ready for what they got afterwards. Hi, yes, uh, I'm calling from the royal court. We think the queen needs an exorcism. Mm hmm. Yeah, we tried that. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried that too. Yes, and we did try the uh, tried and true method of enema, yes. How soon can you get here? Oh, okay, perfect. Yep. Yes, I am available between the hours of 8 to 5. Mm hmm. Number 5. A2 Brute. Agrippina of Rome was like many mothers, in the sense that she would do anything for her kids. I'm sure every mom at home watching would scheme and slaughter their way through Roman nobility in order for her son to become emperor, right? I mean, come on, it's for the family after all. She only did it a few times, and sees the wealth of nobles which further solidified her powerful position. And her son, her beautiful baby boy Nero. How did the young lad return the favor of all this bloodthirst and treachery? Like mother, like son. Chose to fatally remove her of her power. What a nice family story right there. My mom usually just makes turkey with the stuffing, but maybe I can ask for the Roman throne this Christmas. Mom! Number four, revenge. Boudicca was the wife of a man who had spent his time serving the Roman Empire. So when a deal was altered, Darth Vader style, by the Romans over what would happen to her husband's kingdom, she was pissed. Karen pissed. To be fair, she did have a point. They did unsavory and unholy things to her and her daughters. Plus, the Romans totally lied about not annexing their kingdom. Okay, so now it was time for some revenge. She gathered all the people she could and went on the attack. The Romans surprisingly did not fare that well. Boudicca was having such good luck she decided to burn London down. Of course, no civilians were harmed in the process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a lot of people probably didn't do too well as humans can't live in fire. Sure, she was owed some revenge, but burning down a whole city? That's a lot. The Romans did eventually catch up, and she was forced to drink poison in order to avoid capture. She is remembered as somewhat of a hero to some. Number 3. Girl Power Tamar of Georgia was a woman who didn't take kindly to men questioning the rule of a woman. As you would wind up dead. She is, no she is noted for having a hand in the Golden Age of Georgia. Funny enough, she was made a saint even though she vanquished all the orthodox clergymen at the time, for also questioning her rule. Her husband aided in conquering more land, but when he couldn't keep it in his pants, she banished him and remarried. You go, girl. You commit acts of unholiness and stand up for yourself. Number two, serial killer? Daria Saltkova was not necessarily a queen, but she was Russian nobility. She had strong connections with the royal court and other Russian nobility. She was also very unholy. Now, maybe you can blame it on her being widowed. Maybe she's just crazy, but her actions were sadistic. She's noted for having severely tormented her serfs and would straight up just kill them, with numbers reaching at least 138. At first, complaints about family members disappearing after working for her royal nightmare were ignored. She was just too powerful and connected. Eventually, a petition was put together and shown to Catherine the Great, where it was decided Daria would be tried publicly. She spent one hour in a public space in Moscow where people scorned her for her crimes. She was then sentenced to prison where the rest of her days were spent. She is also at times compared to Elizabeth Bathory who committed similar non-nightmare inducing crimes. Just kidding, they were an absolute nightmare. Number 1. Her Royalness Queen Elizabeth II Queen Elizabeth II may be the modern Queen of England, but that does not make her free of controversy and unholiness. If you are to believe in conspiracy theories, then perhaps old Blighty had a hand in a few things that to a normal person would be considered immoral. The death of Princess Diana immediately comes to mind, as there is some evidence to suggest the family is behind it, and her being the queen and all, it's easy to make the connection. But perhaps the most unholy crime ever committed, apparently the queen, 
likes her sandwiches with the crust cut off. Imagine all the extra time needed to trim the crust off every sandwich. I want to talk to HR just thinking about all the extra work. But maybe you can cut the crust off of mine? Um, don't tell anyone though. Okay, thanks. Number 10. No one's ever really gone. You may have heard that said when losing a family member, a pet, or in the worst Star Wars movies ever made. Sorry, not sorry Disney, those are terrible. But perhaps there is someone who is never really gone. Kangas Khan, yes that's right, the ruthless Mongol warrior who conquered so much in his time that we're still talking about it today. So why is this big bad warrior still with us today? Well, that's because of DNA. Yeah, in his time there was uh, lots of activities going on, besides the usual pillaging the village and unaliving those who oppose you. There were a lot of happy endings, let's say, and by that I mean forced non-YouTube friendly conduct bedroom happy endings. So much so that when a study was conducted back in 2003, 8% of men in Asia were thought to be descendants of the mighty man himself. 0.5% worldwide. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about millions of people here. Next time you go out, you may be brushing shoulders with the warrior's kin. Prepare for battle! Number 9. Henry again? Boy, it's really hard not to talk about this guy. But dude was kinda down bad for it. He's just most well known for his mistreatment of his wives. And by mistreatment, I don't mean getting into a fight over whether or not the toilet seat should be up or down and then having a very toxic argument in front of family members. No, because when Henry was upset with marriage, he wanted divorce, which honestly was kind of taboo for the time. Oh yeah, and he also beheaded two of his wives because that's how it goes. I know every couple has their issues to work out, but for most dads out there, having sun-drenched beer-fueled weekends they never go beheading after that. Although, dad's been staring at the lawnmower for a while and there's a lot of blades on that. I don't... Dad? While it is true King Henry VIII did behead two wives, he didn't do it to all of them. And at some points we're honestly quite pleased with his holy sanctity of marriage. Anyone who's ever been married can tell you how peaceful and sacred that bond really is. Number 8. The People's Princess Okay, I know Prince Charles isn't exactly a king, but he is royalty and the man kinda did Diana dirty. That's a quick and half put together allusion to a Michael Jackson song for the English majors and the audience. Being royalty isn't easy. Being royalty in a modern age when paparazzi overwhelm you with lights and cameras just for a juicy piece of gossip like, when was your last bowel movement? Is it slow? Extra extra, read all about it, the princess is constipated. That's just not fun. So after Prince Charles and Princess Diana had been married for a few years, you can understand how excited the media was to find out about their marital disputes. There was three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded, was a quote by Princess Diana that gave the media a field day. Sadly, Prince Charles was having an affair, and it wouldn't be too much longer that Diana would perish in a car accident that may or may not be organized by the royal family themselves. Number 7. Midlife Crisis This one's kinda generalized because if I didn't, I'd have to mention almost every king ever. So here we go. Back in ye olde times, the access to better healthcare just wasn't there. Doctors aren't washing hands. Imagine, buddy eats some greasy mutton and then says, alright, time for your enema. But those aren't the only greasy hands around certain orifices I'm talking about. I'm talking about kings marrying older girls at the ripe age of 12. Yep, that's right. Nothing says experience and womanhood like being 12. People didn't live long, and oftentimes these arranged marriages had ulterior motives, like alliances or business, really. However, that does not make up for marrying a 12 year old who may or may not have started those super weird changing times, like when you were 12, and now there's hair showing up in places that you didn't know there could be hair. I sent a courier to the chief. He came back with this message. It ain't it. Number six, till death do us part. Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, but sometimes the crooning words of Frank Sinatra aren't enough to keep people in love. Sometimes marriages end up like the ones we see on sitcoms, but when there's no laugh track, it's not very funny, and sometimes divorce is the answer. Uh? Medieval Germans thought this too, and something they practiced was divorce by combat. Basically, the man goes into a hole with his arm tied behind his back, and the woman is free to move around with a sack of rocks. These proceedings are strange, as I'm sure no husband or wife married today would ever get so frustrated with one another that they would want to hit one another on the head with rocks. 
Oh, the blessings of being married. Number 5. Domestic Disturbance William the Conqueror was one down bad dude. The illegitimate ruler to the throne left a bad taste in some people's mouths, and was just as ruthless in silencing those rebellions that were always uprising against him as he was with the famous battles he was a part of, like the Battle of Hastings. But what I think he should be remembered by is the way he asked Matilda to marry him, or rather the extreme measures he took when she refused his advances because he was an illegitimate leader. William dragged Matilda by the hair out into the middle of the street and beat her until she agreed to marry him. I don't have to tell you how messed up that is, and I sure hope I don't. Number 4. Nero Sauna The Romans were kind of a big deal, especially if you're into history. Large city, culture, and some other structures are still around today. That's kind of cool. But while the city of Rome may have been the best city on earth at the time, Romans themselves could use a little work. Meet Emperor Nero, the vicious leader of Rome who became emperor through ill-gotten gains. However, in what may have been one of the first acts of flexing the male patriarchy, the divorce or forced separation of his wife Claudia Octavia comes to mind. It was a rocky marriage from the start. There was a general dislike from the very beginning, but when Nero remarried, as emperors did, he had Octavia banished to an island, where shortly after she would be suffocated in a hot vapor bath. Her demise was sad for most Romans. Oh yeah, and they tried to make it look like she did herself in. That's messed up, man. Number 3. Pedestal I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal sometimes. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous. A promising athlete really enjoys collecting stamps. You go, little rock star, collect those presidential stamps. However, Emperor Caligula of Rome had some other ideas. He would literally put his wife, who he claimed to love, up on a pedestal stark naked and let his friends in the military gawk and glare at her. He would also say to her that he could end her life whenever he wanted and put a knife against her for no reason. Weird flex, but okay. This guy was awful to everyone as he tormented and unalived so many people. Well, you sure wouldn't want to see his face everywhere as he liked to do just that. Built statues of himself everywhere because after losing your family to his tyranny and looking at his wife, you need to know who's responsible for all this. That's messed up. Number 2. Doozong 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 That wouldn't really be a great fraternity name, would it? Well, the Emperor of Doozong of China would think differently as when he was in charge, that's pretty much what the royal court looked like. Enough drinking to keep AA in meetings for 100 years, and enough ladies of the evening to... Well, I don't have a joke for this one, but there were a lot of them, trust me. Having massive parties like that and enjoying the company of other women is not how you respect your wife. To make matters worse, it seemed that too much partying may have been a bad thing. Who would have thought? As what he made up for in a fun weekend, he lacked in governing, as the Mongols were at his front door, or gate rather. Eventually, his empire would burn to the ground. All thanks to Al. Alcohol. And many women who laid down for their lives, literally. Number 1. Side Piece Look, I enjoy the company of a woman just as much as the next king sits on his throne. But in my opinion, once you find a wife, it's time to settle down, relax, no more crazy parties like Duzong. This is another generalization, but every king did this. Every king in the past has had mistresses. As if that is a totally okay thing to do to your wife and oftentimes the queen of your kingdom. I'm a reasonable guy, so maybe I can see having your side piece waiting in the wings to be stage center, but it's never one, is it? It's always multiple. Ladies of the past, all I can say is make sure you give birth to a boy and watch your back. They're coming for you. Number 10. Dracula. The man, the myth, the legend. Vlad the Impaler. This dude was so down bad, he was the inspiration for Dracula. There's really only one reason why he was so evil, and honestly, it's in his name. Vlad the Impaler liked to impale people, oftentimes alive. As if this was the worst thing thought up by a human being ever, he would leave the pikes on display, creating a horror only the eyes of medieval Europe could see. There's going to be a lot of bad dudes on this list, some really saucy villains, unsavory characters who will make your skin crawl, but only Vlad has been bad enough to get a monster inspired by him, essentially turning his actions into somewhat of a spooky mythology. Dude gives off some serious goth energy. There's a few portraits of him, but if you look at it, he's got this stare in his eyes, like, 
Like he wants to impale me or something. Vlad be nimble, Vlad be quick, just wait till you see his sharpened sticks. Number nine, the guy everyone knows. Look, YouTube won't let me say his name, but do we really have to? I mean, it's Mustache Man. Infamous for his bad art and lame book, he was the fascist leader of Germany. The very same leader who forced the world into World War II. Remember that one? Yeah. He's the very same monster who organized the destruction of Jewish peoples in Europe, and if he had his way, probably the whole world. I wouldn't be surprised if you showed a picture of him to anyone on Earth, any country, rich or poor, and they will most likely know who that was. That's the kind of evil that will get you talked about in classes all over the world, and likely for a long time. Eventually, he got what was coming to him, and the world had peace and prosperity, and there was never ever another bad, stinky war ever again. Why is he not number one, you might be asking? Well, that's just because his numbers don't compare to others, which is a very troubling statistic. I'll get to that later. Number eight, busy man. Most people on this list are not going to need any introduction. Genghis Khan is no exception to that. The Mongol warrior king saw his nomadic empire stretch thousands of miles, being one of history's largest empires. If you've been paying attention in history class, and you should have been, don't skip class or Big Ched will put you in the naughty corner. But yes, that's right, I just referred to myself in the third person. Speaking of third person, that's how many people Genghis unalive in his bloody conquests. Oh, did I say three? I actually meant a lot. Did I say a lot? I actually meant a disturbing amount. Some people like to point out that he was accepting of other people's cultures and beliefs. Yes, that is true, but that's after he burned down the village right before he got to yours, and you got forcibly assimilated into his numbers. As you can also imagine, a bloodthirsty barbarian like him did not treat women with much respect. It's King of Khan, man. That's, that's just how it do be. Number seven, so long, Bowser. Ivan the Terrible. Okay, sure, Vlad was called the Impaler, but you can kind of take that a different way, right? Not in that way. All innuendos aside, with a name like Ivan the Terrible, it's kind of hard to work around that. Even as a child, Ivan was showing traits of an evil dictator, or supervillain really, as it's said that he would throw animals off of tall roofs in the same way that Mario throws Bowser off of platforms. Becoming the first Tsar of Russia, and probably its worst, he's responsible for many horrors and crimes, but the most infamous being his responsibility for his own son's demise. After a heated argument regarding his unborn grandson, and in a binding fit of rage, Ivan claimed his son's life. Sure, dads get angry when sons don't help mow the lawns or help take out the trash, but that's going a little far. One minute you're having a fight with your dad, and the next minute you're being carried out by Ghani and pallbearers. You know, the dancing guys, the memes, the casket, you know? Yeah, it's a joke. Number six, the mad doctor. I love doctors. Shout out to the people working in the medical field right now. I appreciate you. I couldn't even imagine the horror that is medical school, though. We all know my track record for reading, and hours upon hours of studying would just be bad for my health. I gotta squeeze more video game time in there. It's just how I work, man. However, one doctor I would not want to cross is Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. He is most likely the inspiration for a lot of horror movies. A serial unaliver said to have been performing surgeries on animals at a young age. Which, again, doing some freaky deaky stuff to animals as a kid is like the red flag of red flags. It's like the only red flag. If that wasn't enough, he used to steal cadavers from the university he was studying at and, and doing all kinds of not nice things to them, not naughty, bad. Having a clear obsession with medical practices and anatomy probably was helpful in disposing of his victims. And like something from Tales of the Crypt Keeper, that's exactly what he did. He constructed a large house, or building really, with trap doors, secret tunnels, and a lot of rooms. A basement where he could dispose of his victims. He would later then open this house of horrors up as a hotel where unknowing people would come to meet their doom. Yes, it's Tales of the Crypt Keeper! <laughs> Come check in to the Hotel of Doom! Number five, bad comrade. Stosif Jolin was the leader of the Soviet Union for probably too long. A man who worked his way up the political chain until general secretary meant leader, which if you look it up, it's kind of crazy. That itself is a crazy story. He's responsible for a great loss of life. It is estimated in the range of 40 million people. Ooh, yikes. Most spooky evil dudes usually go after an enemy, 
to someone they considered to not be part of them. He did do this, but a lot of his own people sadly met their ends from the Red Menace too. Organized and deliberate purges of people and famines to starve people. It's safe to say he is and was and always will be one of the worst humans to ever walk the face of the earth. To put it in perspective, Jolin's son was a soldier in World War II, and after being captured by German forces, the Germans thought they had one on the bus. Heck, this was a get out of jail free card, right? Well, when a prisoner trade was proposed by the Germans, Jolin laughed at only how an evil communist could, and denied the trade. His son would later perish in a POW camp shortly after. What a monster. You think you trade with me? Ah, keep them, I don't want. Number four, fine white powder. Oh, to be in Miami in the mid 1980s. If I had one wish, it would be to spend a summer night in the neon soaked beaches of Miami under strict laws enforced by a president who didn't know what was going on right underneath his nose. If you were around back then, then you probably got to experience something like that. Or at least in my fever dreams. I hope so. But as much as I'd like to be Tony Montana with all that sugar on his desk, I know it's bad for my health. Speaking of bad for your health, Pablo Escobar. I know, that's where I went with that. Probably the most ruthless criminal ever to live on planet Earth. Pablo was a poor man born in a poor country, but ended up being one of, if not the richest man on planet Earth. His lucrative distribution of adult sugar in the 80s made him very wealthy. It also made him very dangerous, as he was willing to do whatever to get his way. Extortion, bribing, bombing, just about anything you can think of. Oh yeah, he was one bad dude. He had so much money that he had to bury it all all over Colombia. Every once in a while, some of his buried treasure pops up. And as much as I want a quick million in US cash, I'll just put it back where it came from. Oh, Dios mío, lo siento, Pablo. Number three, Al Capone. Another ruthless criminal, and honestly, Capone walked so gangsters like Pablo could run. Part of the ruthless Italian mafia that was the outfit, Capone worked his way through the ranks during 1920s Prohibition America, earning millions in his time where really just $100 could stretch a long way. Capone is noted for his violent behavior throughout his life and the many accidents accidents he caused directly or indirectly. Prohibition and the depression were hard times for a lot of folks in America. However, the media and the people of Chicago at first always wanted to see what the lavish gangster was up to as his criminal life became somewhat publicized. Most likely due to his wealth, the dude was rich. He eventually would get arrested and sent to Alcatraz, which was probably the worst prison in America or the best Call of Duty zombies map depending on how you look at things. I look at things through a Call of Duty way, so eh. Number two, Gavrila Princip. That might not be a name that you're familiar with, but it was the man who unalived Franz Ferdinand, which started World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which caused the collapse of Soviet Russia, and it's why you live in a post-war globalist world with markets developing rapidly in the cyber world. Except maybe the whole thing in Ukraine, watch out for that. Kinda crazy to think how all that could come from one wrong turn and a guy seizing an opportunity. But this also means he's kind of responsible, in a way, for all the bad stuff that happened in those times as well. So maybe don't seize the day? I'm not sure. Just, just don't be ruthless criminals, guys. Watch our videos instead. Although I could blame them for failing my math test in high school. Yeah, we'll go with that. Number one, Mao Zedong. I'd like to come out here and tell you all about the chairman of China, but that simply is just too hot for TV, and if it's too hot for TV, it's too hot for YouTube. Basically, he was the dictator of communist China and is responsible for many lives lost. It's estimated to be somewhere in the range of 60 to 80 million people. Whoa. <laughs> Dude was down bad, the definition of down bad, and although many were told to adore him, there's still a great many people who remember the terrible things he's done. From Beijing to Hong Kong, there's not a person around who doesn't know who he is. If being a no good rotten person was an Olympic sport, he would have gold medals coming out of his ears. Kicking off the list at number 10, a fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As 
long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. And then he farted and disappeared. Number nine, access to clean water. Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. Or Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior. MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women. That was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits. He would cry and stomp his feet, literally. You know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh? Maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pasta, ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Ugh. Food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. For Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts. And if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chain mail underneath your armor no way, my body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half, no way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chainmail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start with a little 
little tot, a little royal tot. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire, a knight's intern. Not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official ting, ting, knight. That's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal Scott I Walker. FBI, what's up? What's happening, y'all? Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh, and my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force, or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches. So much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard. So even if they land on something, they get all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus, they also have some good property and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy, must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. New Schwinstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch on your phone. Maybe featuring a large kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome tall funny comedian with the neck thing, I don't know. Kings of Yieldy Times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because, because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, the guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head. Right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. 
Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, a pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just, they just kiss the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just, Let's go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With it's so weird. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies. Specifically, King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands, it's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say, I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh no, not again, come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor would just be like, ah, yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like, what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. Now I'm just mad. I just, like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So, of course, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So King James IV, apparently, this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man, like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh, oh boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline. 
Ba, ba, ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down. That's good. That's good. Wait, wait. It does rhyme. That's good. Yeah, check that out. Rest in peace. My gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on Coronation Day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either. Nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back. He had six wives and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things, like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. <laughs> like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange, especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each was 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record. Ho ho, the most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud, he was like, Oh, that fool? It was I. Number four, Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's Watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful. What a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology. So next time you read your horoscope, remember it's bones in the jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars animals. I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I wanna say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that I say don't. No, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary Queen of Scots was one of them. Margaret of Valois, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria, but his mental conditions grew worse and it went south, shocker. Number two, heart of glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the beloved and then quickly nicknamed the mad. What happened? After he became king of France in 1380, he would have these 
episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s and Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it shattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. I think there's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Number 10, Boudica. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St. Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number nine, Nefertiti. Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatau, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. There's like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number eight, Anne Boleyn. Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, 
Divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church. So when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kind of had to go, prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. God, I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Queen Dida. Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dida here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor and well, she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes, how dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dida got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kishmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kishmir has ever had. Number 6, Queen Nandi. Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She-Elephant. She alongside her son wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who funnily enough remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the empire ever existed in the first place and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kinda get it. Number 5, Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker. Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number 4, Queen Theodora. Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite. She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son Edward III until he came into power. 
She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband Edward II while he was captured. Eventually, her son would come into power and she was imprisoned for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two, Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the fifth century, marrying King Chilperic. And organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brunhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number one, Cleopatra. A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. <sighs> I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic, which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. Number 10, Irene of Athens. First off, it's safe to say that all these people were a little spoiled. Like the royal family times a thousand. When you're named after cities, you were like rich rich. Irene of Athens was Byzantine's empress to Emperor Leo IV and co-ruler from 792 until 797. Mother to son Constantine VI and sole ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah, that's quite a resume, Irene. The quote, untimely death, okay, of her husband caused the throne to fall to her. Interesting. Although when Irene's son Constantine was a teen, several revolts tried to make him sole ruler. Mom caught on in 797, and Irene gouged out both of her son's eyes and imprisoned him, dying shortly after. Talk about grounded, dude. Mom's in that unconditional love, huh? A revolt years later overthrew Irene and exiled her to a remote island where Irene died months later. History's dark, huh? She's like, I'm gonna count to three, and then I'm gonna rip out your eyes. One? Two. Number nine, Valeria Messalina. Turning the clocks back to 17, you know, the year 17, just 17 AD, a classic. That in 2016, solid years. Metaphorically and literally, ancient Romans paved the way for following civilizations. They achieved some groundbreaking stuff in their time, but the empress of the Romans at that time, from 17 AD to 48 AD, Valeria Messalina, well, she was too focused on a more lavish business rather than ruling over armies at that time. Many accounts in history can confirm this. Pliny the Elder wrote about it as well, so you know it's the... Real deal. Valeria, she owned a big fancy house where ladies of the evening would come and go. She made a lot of money. This is where the finest ladies who weren't even involved in that kind of lifestyle or that kind of business, this is where they changed their minds. Know what I mean? It was a big deal. She was changing the game. Because of Valeria and the operation she was running, sometimes Valeria herself would participate in these 
games. Yeah, contests, if I may, to see who could tango with the most people in one night. Yeah, Valeria hit 25 in one night, so yeah, I'd say she ruined a few parties for sure. I mean, her husband, Emperor Claudius, would at least agree, no? Number eight, Catherine de Medici. Catherine de Medici was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous, famous family. She was queen of France from 1547 to 1559 with marriage to King Henry II and mother of four future French kings, Francis II, Charles IX, Henry III. The years during which all her sons reigned have been called the age of Catherine de Medici, as she has extensive influence in politics in France at the time. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, she raised those boys. She was like the secret hand making all the decisions, but she was cool and subtle. She's basically the Kris Jenner of her time. She married Henry, second son of King Francis, and after the king took part in some friendly jousting, he was smashed in the face and the splinters took his life days later. Ouch. Catherine then and her frail 15-year-old son were king and queen. When he died, she took power again till her 10-year-old son was ready. After that, he died, same thing for the third son. The age expectancy was abysmal back then. She ruled with her youngest until her illness in her late 40s. Hmm. Number seven, Queen Rana Valona the first, the last queen of Madagascar. Where to begin? Queen Rana Valona, one of the worst in history. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was cruel, violent, and would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with power. It's pretty sad. In the late 1700s, the king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him, as everywhere that happens. And the king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. Okay. The king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, his daughter being Rana Valona. And now she was set to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now when her prince was alive, they didn't get along. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized, of course, that she, you know, poisoned him, so that's probable and horrible. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Yeah, just to give you an idea of how she handled things. Yuck. Number six, Bloody Mary. England's first female monarch, Mary I, ruled for just five years. The only surviving child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Mary took the throne after the brief reign of her half-brother. They say she was an evil queen, but after doing my homework, yeah, I'd have some chips on my shoulders as well. Married at nine and 11? Everyone's just yelling at you because you're too young to have kids? Yeah, that's awful. She was promoted and demoted so many times, no wonder she did what she did. Every time she was close to the throne, all of a sudden her family tree was just like rearranged by law. Her dad decided to go down the other family route. Nice, nice. She's infamously remembered for burning 300 English Protestants at the stake, which earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. Her brother found a loophole with religion, so she was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, light him up. She's also famously remembered as teaming up with her half-sister, Elizabeth I, and ruling together as sisters, making them the first two British queens. She was spoiled from birth, but she's kind of a badass. Anyone that did her harm, past or present, they were either sent to the tower or the chopping block. Checkmate. Number five, Empress Agrippina. Continuing on from 48 AD, the next leading lady in charge of ancient Rome was Julia Agrippina. And right off the bat, she was already spoiled. Yeah, she lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor. Of course she did. She had a family, but still, that somehow all wasn't enough for Empress Agrippina. And she wanted more. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors, of course, as one would. She believed that her and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she lied her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law just so they could get married. Yeah, love it. Gotta change the rules, I guess. We can do that? Okay. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, suddenly, just out of the blue, huh, oh no, Claudius passed away. Crazy. Most people think Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. The empress and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so she could, you know, hold on to that little bit of power. But eventually Nero got tired of his mom talking over his shoulders. He's like, you know what? No, you go to your room. How does that sound? Nero then had her forced out of said power. And Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and, you know, overthrow throw the power, but plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Yeah, I'm watching a lot of Survivor right now. In Survivor, we call that a blind side, Jeff. Here we go. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ptolemy, I had to. 
Number 4. Diane de Poitiers Diane de Poitiers was a French noblewoman. She held power and influence as King Henry II's royal mistress and advisor until his death. And at the tender age of 15, Diane was married to Louise de Brez, the much, much older and grandson to the King of France. They had two daughters, Francois and Louise. After his death, she took interest in another very powerful man, her childhood crush, friend, and the new king. Uh oh, Henry married to Catherine de Medici. Wait, like that, Catherine? Yeah. Oh yeah, talk about a bizarre love triangle of power. After he got clocked in the face and died in a jousting accident like I said before, Diane adopted the habit of wearing black and white for the rest of her life. Queen Catherine de Medici soon assumed control though, restricting her access to the royal chambers from Henry's deathbed and not even allowing her at the royal funeral. I mean, she's a married woman. Wives and their husbands' mistresses. Copying her style, stealing her man and her crown. She was exiled, comfortably. Like early, early rich retirement. Spoiled. What do you think? Number three, Princess Margaret. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret, I have to mention, she partied with rock stars during the 60s, okay? I'm not gonna leave her out of this list. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this badass, I guess, in the media, whatever. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Yeah, Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry the princess. How fun is that? Also, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming, that was a wake up call. Guess my whole life's a lie. Sick. Hit that thumbs up button if you also agree that Pablo's more recent. Insane. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV, okay? She was a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. Now, in 1968, word had spread that the princess had an affair with nightclub pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who just a year and a half later sadly took his own life. And then come 1973, paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. Ooh la la. Ooh, big zoom on that one. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated. Yeah, she had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. Yeah, how dare her decide what she wants to do with her body post-death. Uh. Number two, Cleopatra. Talk about spoiled. Cleopatra Philopater was queen of the kingdom of Egypt from 51 to 30 BC and its last active ruler. From both Roman and Egyptian blood, Cleopatra accompanied her father, Ptolemy XII, into exile to Rome. But after a revolt in Egypt, his rival daughter, Berenice, claimed his throne. Ooh, siblings, am I right? What are you looking at? Berenice was killed in 55 BC when Ptolemy, her, and Cleopatra's brother returned to Egypt with a Roman military and took revenge. Yeah, more siblings. When dad died, the reign of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy 13 was born and short lived because arch nemesis Julius Caesar and him kind of hated each other. And yet, another war. Cleopatra sided with her brother's foe this time. Yeah, lots of switching sides back and forth, huh? Not a lot of loyalty in these families. I don't know. Eventually, she cheated on him with Mark Antony, resulting in yet another war. After Antony was defeated, it led her love to take his own life out of shame and guilt. When Cleopatra found out about this, she poisoned herself following him into the afterlife. Yeah, that's loyalty. That's true love. The OG Romeo and Juliet. Also, Shakespeare does a wonderful show around the affairs and power of these two. Eternity was in our lips and in our eyes. Antony, act one, scene one. That's beautiful. Beautiful, lovely. And number one, Clara Ward. Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up quite the conversation. She was famous, but you know, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal. That's it, the rest is history. Since birth though, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband in the first place, okay? She was born into a wealthy industrialist family, but she would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, make it look good, shake some hands, get some photos. Hey, yeah, nice button, awesome, see you later. She's involved, you know, she's part of the team. But then she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman, Kime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back with him said wife. People were freaking out at this point. A royal married a common American girl? This is unheard of. She was the talk of every town. See, unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off her newfound wealth. Some loved her in her image, others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician, and after her divorce, she turned to modeling. So yeah, it seems like she was in it for one reason. I don't know. I feel like she enjoyed the clout, just a little bit, right? Just a bit. Number 10 in our countdown is Julia Get a Grip Agrippina. When the Emperor Claudius's wife, Melissiana, became entangled in an 
adultery scandal, the power position of the Roman Empress was suddenly wide open in the year 49. Julia Agrippina, exiled for a conspiracy against her first husband and widowed from her second that she was believed to have poisoned, concocted a scheme. In an outrageous maneuver, she seduced her own uncle Claudius to become his fourth wife. She didn't stop there, however. She then had her uncle husband make the son she had had in her prior marriage, Nero, his heir by marrying him to his own daughter from his previous marriage. Ooh, now that's that's quite a family tree. Taking the title Augusta, she maintained a stronghold over political and household affairs, considering herself a co-ruler to her husband. After Claudius died from eating poisoned food, which is how her prior husband died, so make the connection there, Nero became a Roman emperor and would forever change Roman history in his time of rule. However, Agrippina could only hover above her son for so long, and his annoyance of her invasiveness grew. Nero chose to assassinate his mother with a trap, a boat set forth on the Bay of Naples designed to sink. But when it did, she swam ashore. Nero changed his plans and had his soldiers invade her summer home to do the deed instead. Number 9 in our countdown may be one of our most badass queens, Empress Theodora, from street busker to top dog. Syrian born Theodora starts her journey as an actress, dancer, and mime alongside her two sisters in the late 400s, something she abandons by age 16 to be a mistress to a Syrian official. And she travels much of North Africa with him before his maltreatment and temper made her settle down in Egypt alone, where she took up wool spinning. It was here she met Emperor Justinian and the two fell in love, and after Justinian changed some laws so that they could marry, they began co-ruling the Byzantine Empire together. So what made her mad you may ask? Her ideals and the smearing that they led to through history. She was historically known for supporting religious freedoms, women's rights, and the education of the masses. Her decisions, which reflected her opinions, led to the Nicaea riots of Constantinople. She intervened and was able to persuade her husband to stay. The two successfully quelled the revolt and in turn, she made Constantinople one of the most sophisticated cities in the world and promoted women's equity. Theodora's name appears in almost all the legislation passed during the period and she received foreign envoys and correspondence with foreign rulers. Her husband died in 1527 AD and Theodora took sole control of the Roman Empire. Under her reign, bridges, aqueducts, and churches were built. Theodora died of cancer on June 28, 548 AD. She and Justinian are both considered saints by the Eastern Orthodox Church. The she wolf of France is is in number 8 of our countdown. Her actual name is Queen Isabella of England, and she was famously married to the closeted Edward II. Acting as a beard to someone who doesn't love you would be hard enough, but the two did also have to produce heirs together. One would be the future King Edward III. Queen Isabella was in a desolate and lonely situation, especially as her husband's two male suitors, Piers Gaveston, who he gifted her jewels to, and Hugh Dispenser, who was a wildly hated extortionist, were always his preferred company. So she rounded up some spiteful nobles. For First killing Gaveston by beheading, and then driving Dispenser from the country and redistributing his wealth. King Edward unsurprisingly was upset and sieged against those who had contributed to the death and exile of his lovers, all whilst his wife took cover in the Tower of London. It's here she met exiled British traitor Lord Roger Mortimer and started her own affair. She had him broken out and sent to France where she later joined him and with her son, and then sent Edward a letter that essentially said, suck it. The anger at having been cast aside turned into burning desire for vengeance as Isabella invaded England with her new husband and army and upsurped the throne, where she and Mortimer then ruled until her son came of age and had her dethroned for her violent tendencies. She died 28 years later in retirement, and Edward III later went on to rule England for 50 remarkable years. Maria the Mad comes in at number 7 of our countdown. She was just 16 years old when she became the Princess of Brazil and the Duchess of Braxana, then their queen following the passing of her father. Brazil changed from just a Portuguese colony to a large kingdom. Brazil, the Algraves, and the United Kingdom of Portugal are three famous formations recorded under Maria the Mad and her son. After the death of the queen's husband slash uncle in 1780, however, there was a noticeable decline in her mental health. 1788 saw the passing of her daughter, newborn son, and her closest confidant. By 1792, after the passing of her eldest son a year prior, Maria seemed to be experiencing a combined symptoms of hallucinations, depression, and anxiety, all resulting from mass traumatic losses. It evolved to later include religious mania and melancholia. She started avoiding court gatherings and social or royal obligations. It was then her treatment went to Dr. Francis Willis, who tried straitjacketing, blistering, and ice baths, none of which were helpful for 
obvious reasons. After treatment for more than five years, he declared the disease was incurable. By 1792, Maria was no longer a capable ruler and deemed insane. Courts pushed her son John to take over the government ruling, but he delayed until he finally took the throne in 1799 for a truly tragic reason. There was just no longer any possibility that his mother would ever recover her senses. If the nickname Maria the Mad wasn't already taken, then this next Maria named Monarch would have snatched it up. In at number six is Maria Eleonora of Bradenburg. Maria Eleonora was born in 1599 to Prince of Bradenburg and Anna, Duchess of Prussia. She grew up pampered, and Maria Eleonora was the it girl of the 17th century. All powerful monarchs fell over themselves to marry her. While she was dismissive of the 22 year old Swedish King Gustav Adolphus initially, in 1620 she changed her tune as she had apparently fallen in love with him practically overnight. And so they were married. With the king so frequently risking his life in battle, it became imperative that his wife produce a male heir. So Maria had to hanker down and focus on the baby making business. Maria experienced three stillborn children consecutively before the successful birth of her daughter in 1626. It was a rare break in battle, so her husband was there to excitedly greet his daughter. Maria, however, had a very different response. Her baby was born with the condition fleece lanugo, a condition where hair covers the body of a newborn. Her infant was enveloped from its head to its knees, leaving only its face, arms, and lower legs visible. Maria was horrified, claiming to have birthed a demon, and rejected her daughter for the decade to come, even after losing her husband in 1632 Battle of Lutzen. And while everyone mourns their own way, it's easy to say Maria really took it up a notch. She forced their daughter to sleep in blacked out rooms and reportedly hung King Gustav's heart in a golden casket on the ceiling above the bed, making the girl sleep directly under her father's blessed remains. In 1633, Maria Eleonora returned to Sweden with her beloved's embalmed body. She refused to bury Gustav for more than a year, reportedly embracing and caressing the decomposing king. Maria's story continues to become more demented with time and her daughter grows to become her caretaker, especially when troublesome Maria runs away to Denmark permanently and her daughter's left to become the queen and pay her mom's allowance to Danish royals. Awkward. Number 5 may have not gone mad, but it was her favourite emotion, Empress Anna of Russia. She is remembered as a horrible and spiteful child with a cruelty streak. Young Anna it was reported to be mannerless and vulgar. So when her father, who experienced a stroke shortly after her birth that left him handicapped, passed away, her very traditional mother attempted to raise her in classic elements of strict religious femininity, so she may be a quiet and obedient woman. Anna had other plans. She hunted animals, kept guns and swords, and terrorized other children as well as the commoners. This behavior was all a massive red flag for some of the crazy things she'd do later in life when granted power and the means. Anna's only husband ever was Frederick Williams, who at their reception indulged a little too heavy on alcohol and gave him a hangover so wicked that three days later he just died. In 1730, her uncle Peter the Great passed. The Privy Council turned her into the Empress of all of Russia since she was widowed and childless, which was assumed to cause less trouble. The joke's on them because she turned around and immediately abolished the Supreme Privy Council and re-established the autocracy. Now she had the sole power, and while she made some serious political waves, Anna also made some strange choices. She has a serious vendetta with Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth was a better looking, younger, and also a rival for her throne. So she ruined her life. No nobleman could marry Elizabeth. If Elizabeth chose a commoner, the Empress would strip her of her titles and her claim to the throne. When Anna found out about Elizabeth's side piece, the unhinged Empress ordered her men to cut out his tongue and exiled him to Serbia. Anna even woke up one morning and decided to force Prince Mikhail to marry her lower class older maid as a joke. After the ceremony wrapped up, Anna placed the prince, Mikhail, and the maid in a cage, dressed them as clowns, and paraded them on top of an elephant to an ice palace she had constructed for their honeymoon. In the extreme cold of Russia, she reportedly advised them to get to doing the dirty with each other if they wanted to keep their bodies warm enough to stay alive. Maria Eleonora wasn't the only queen who couldn't give up on a dead relationship, pun intended. Number 4 is Joanna of Castile. Never meant to be a princess, let alone a queen, Joanna earned her title and nickname Joanna La Loca through unfortunate means. She had two older siblings, Isabella who passed in 1498 and Joan in 1497. Joanna's mother, the formidable Catholic monarch Isabella I of Castile, passed away in 1504. This left the throne to, of Castile and Leon to Joanna when her father passed in 1517. Joanna had started exhibiting signs of mental instability in 1504 when her mother had been sick. She was struggling to eat or sleep and having outbursts of anger. One such example was when she wished to go see her husband in Flanders, the journey would take her through France, which Castile were at war with at the time. When she was prevented from leading for Flanders, 24 year old Joanna flew into a rage. Perhaps one of Joanna's most notable displays of mental instability occurred when her husband died in 
2006. Joanna refused to part with her deceased husband's remains for a disturbingly long time, reportedly opening the casket to kiss or embrace him. I'm seeing a pattern here with some of these women. While pregnant, Joanna traveled with her husband's body from Burgos to Granada, a distance of 668 kilometers, which would take around six and a half hours to drive in a car today. And talk about a romantic imbalance, while she did all of this posthumously, when her husband Philip was alive, he talked Joanna's madness to anyone that would listen and completely discredited the woman. In 1509, Joanna was placed in the royal monastery slash covenant of Santa Clara and Tostillas, Castile, by her son Charles, who also forbade Joanna to have any visitors until her passing. The most recognizable name on our list is Marie Antoinette, who is number three in our countdown. Married at only 14, Marie was known to have lived an opulent lifestyle, but there was a lot of conspiracy and debate about the young woman. She was performing what she knew her royal duties to be, and she was known for not always being the most educated. She started the trend of riding donkeys and the worldwide trend of feathered slash stuffed bird hats. She even once had an entire miniature village created with functioning shops so that she and other elites may dress like commoners and experience living lower status. Marie was misguided and young, but she was also the victim of an incredible smear campaign. She was accused of having ulterior motives constantly, supplying the Austrians with military plans or siphoning millions of livres of treasury money to Austria. It was the tales of sexual deviants that were the most damaging though. Alleged to have had orgies, laid with commoners, or even have sex with her own ladies in waiting. Her most offensive accusal was thrown at her in trial before her famous decapitation where she was accused of committing indiscretions with her own child Louise Charles. With such a vast array of accusations against her, not one of which was supported by any concrete evidence, the trial was a formality, conceived merely as a step towards completing the revolution. Marie Antoinette was declared guilty and executed only hours later at the age of 37. Speaking of sexual deviants, meet Queen Anna Nazinga, who is number two in our countdown. Queen of what's now known as present day Angola, Anna took the crown when her brother passed away. Being queen of Angola was hard work. Anna managed to keep the Portuguese invaders out for over 40 years alone. So how would you, a tough and titanous queen, decompress? Why by building a harem, of course. Anna collected the men she found to be the most attractive warriors in her region, keeping a harem of 50 to 60 men close at hand for whenever she, well, wanted a romp in the sack. Spending a great deal of her time strategizing around battlefield in men's apparel, some historians wonder if that's why she required the men in her harem to dress as women. Now Anna didn't have time to deal with picking who she was going to sleep with every night, so she devised a unique system. Anna would just have the two men who desired her the most that evening fight to the death every night and then bed the winner. The next day, the winner still loses as she would have them executed. Anna disbanded her harem at 75 when she took on her teenage husband, cementing her status as not only a serious badass who liberated her people and established dominance in an era of men, but also as a cougar. The next queen fought her way to the top of the countdown. Number one is Queen Rananavola the first. During her reign of Madagascar, Queen Rananavola the first is remembered as a dangerous tyrant who ruled her island nation with cruelty and an iron fist. Rananavola was a merciless to those who tried to colonize her nation, but also to those inhabiting it. Should crimes, disputes, or discourse arise, Rananavola had a nifty trick to solve it called trial by ordeal. Both parties would be forced to ingest three pieces of chicken skin alongside a poison taken from a native plant, Tangana. Throw up your chicken skins and you're proclaimed innocent, hooray! If you didn't, you were guilty and be put to death, if the poison didn't kill you first. This trial was one of the punishments used in her persecution of Christian colonists, alongside throwing people into rock quarries and live dismemberments. Her horrific list really will go on. Rana Lavona was such a deadly tyrant that the queen managed to reduce her country's population from 5 million people in 1833 to 2.5 million in 1830. All through means of war, executions, religious persecution, or just settling scores. Depicted as a deranged tyrant even after her death in 1861, many have tried to repaint her image as one of a driven ruler trying to keep her culture and country independent from those trying to grow their own selfish empires. What's your take? Queen Victoria was anti women's rights. Ah, isn't that fun? Queen Victoria, who ruled England from 1837 until 1901, was in the perfect position to be the forerunner for the women's movement. Meanwhile, she's up in her office writing letters stating that the movement of the present day to place women in the same profession as men was mad and utterly demoralizing. She stated a woman's place was in the home and also condemned the idea of a woman becoming doctors or any career. In a letter written by Victoria to her uncle Leopold, king of the Belgians, she wrote that her husband Albert grows daily fonder of politics and business and is wonderfully fit for both. And I grow daily to dislike them both more and more. We women are not made for governing. And if we are good women, we must dislike these masculine occupations. Y'all, the queen wrote that. In 
1850, the Queen was faced with the Women's Franchise Bill passing in Parliament and began a very lengthy correspondence with Prime Minister William Gladstone, letting him know about her strong aversion to the so-called erroneous rights of women, and that she felt so strongly upon this dangerous, unchristian, and natural cry and movement of women's rights that she is most anxious that Mr. Gladstone and others should take some steps to check this alarming danger. Let woman be what God intended, a helpmate for man, but with totally different duties and vocations. Yeah, it didn't age well. And if you're doubting me, let's take a look at this petty beef. Queen Victoria was not for the girlies. She was a bitter and jealous b-word a lot of the time and over many different things. One was Lady Flora Hastings, lady-in-waiting, but also very close friend to Victoria's mother, who in 1839 presented herself to the Queen's dock with abdominal pain and a severe gut swelling. Lady Flora had been part of the royal household during Victoria's upbringing when the young heir to the throne was subjected to a strict system of rules and regulations that left her isolated and unhappy. The Queen still harbored that grudge against Flora because of her association with this bleak time and also her mother, who Victoria had serious mommy issues for. Anyways, Flora was unmarried, so the immediate visual symptoms led to an assumption she was preggers, out of wedlock. Demon ass Victoria rebels in this opportunity and she has former governess Baroness Lezen obligingly spread the rumor that Flora is pregnant. Since Victoria suspected the father was a much hated guardian from her childhood, Sir John Conray, she threw that into boot. Hastings is published publicly humiliated, forced to protest her innocence, and undergo a gynecological examination, which proved in fact she was not pregnant. Her swollen stomach was due to advanced liver cancer and she died a couple weeks after. Conroy and others spearheaded a press campaign to slam the queen and her fellow conspirators for smearing and defaming the Lady Flora. It dented the young queen's popularity and at Flora's funeral two months later, the people quite literally dented her carriage when they stoned it. A lot of hypocrisy, especially from a woman of many lovers, one of whom was very obviously John Brown scandal. The worst day of Queen Victoria's life, the day her husband Albert died. The second worst day of Victoria's life, when her loyal servant John Brown died. John Brown served as the Queen's constant companion and he pledged to be with her always. After the death of Albert, Victoria relied on her devoted manservant from Scotland for everything. Victoria's children referred to him as mama's lover, naturally, due to the fact they slept in adjoining room. Heated gossip naturally made its way around, why Brown's shocking informal manner with the Queen and his high-handed rude ways with other royals seemed to suggest his closeness with Victoria, in the words of one contemporary insider, was contrary to etiquette and even decency. Speculation that the two secretly wed came out when the Queen's chaplain claimed on his deathbed that he performed the ceremony. There was also talk of three additional hidden children. Premarital relations between John Brown and Victoria are a possible marriage, it's never been proven. However, when Victoria died, she requested a photo of him be placed in her coffin, along with a lock of his hair, some of his letters, and his mother's wedding ring he had gifted her. When Victoria died, her son Edward had any statuary destroyed or removed that talked of Brown. He also had 300 letters of his mother's burned. The British monarchy has been known to be better than the KGB at covering up its scandals and destroying evidence, and Abdul Karim is a great example. The portrayal of Karim in Western biographies is that of a rogue who manipulated the queen for wealth. Naturally, that's the classic British racism that brought us colonialism. Abdul was only 20 when he arrived in England, but Queen Victoria was smitten by the young man's intelligence, charm, and seriously hardcore work ethic, and admittedly his height. Victoria upped his status by making Abdul her teacher in the language of Urdu. In return, he introduced her to curry, Urdu writing, and even hookah. That's right, they were hot box and castles, guys. The court was meanwhile repulsed. Abdul was Muslim and supposed to be a servant, and yet he was closer to the queen than anyone else in her immediate circle. Four decades his senior, Victoria brought Abdul with with her on all her trips and treated him as a close companion. While a romantic relationship is insanely unlikely, the queen was signing her letters as dearest mother to Kareem, the two surely had a special bond. The English courtiers hated him and Victoria chose to ignore that snobbish and racist behavior by forbidding it. Naturally, it doesn't make it go away, but it means it didn't happen in her presence. In her final wishes, she was quite explicit. Kareem would be one of the principal mourners at her funeral, an honor afforded to the monarch's closest friends and family. Victoria could not control what happened to the Munshi from beyond the grave, but she did everything in her power to mitigate the treatment she presumed that the family would inflict. Queen's fear is justified. Upon her death, Victoria's children worked swiftly to evict her mother's favorite advisor. Edward sent guards to the cottage Karim shared with his wife, seized all the letters from the queen, and burnt them on the spot. They instructed Karim to return to India immediately, without any fanfare or farewell, and Victoria's daughter Beatrice erased all 
full reference to Karim in the Queen's journals, an effing commitment given Victoria's decade plus relationship with them. The royal family's eradication of Karim was so thorough, a full 100 years would pass before an eagle eyed journalist noticed a strange clue left in Victoria's summer home on a tour. Her consequential investigation led to the discovery of Victoria's relationship, the worldwide attention of it, the novel, the movie, and the finding of his heirs. Meanwhile, when the Queen didn't like you, it was back to the usual political agitation and request denied. In 1822, after a few small time jobs in the Tory governments over the years, Robert Peel became Home Secretary, where he famously established Metropolitan Police Force for London and reformed criminal law to reduce the number of offences punishable by death and educate prisoners. In 1834, three years before the events of Victoria, Peel became Prime Minister of a minority Tory government. Those governments struggled to pass legislation against the majority rival Whig party and eventually resigned in frustration after just 100 days or so in power. Then in 1839, Peel got the chance to form the Tory government by Queen Victoria, but he asked in return she replace the Whig ladies of her household with Tory equivalents. Said ladies in waiting were her friends and many were married or related to the Whig ministers and MPs, so Peel refused to form government and Whigs returned to power. The Whig government was limping but Victoria was passionately attached to Prime Minister Lord Melbourne and also refused to dismiss her female friends. It took the royal wedding of Albert and a failed attempt on their lives in the following year to revive the hatred that this gathered her from the public. And speaking of, Miss Victoria gave the progressive Prime Minister's endless hell. While lapping up the flattery of her favourite Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, who famously admitted he laid it on with a trowel, she never hid her intense dislike of William Gladstone. His approach to the PM role was progressive social policies and she absolutely hated it. And his proposed plan for Irish home rule, which she considered a threat to her empire. Any name she could toss, she would. A mischievous firebrand, arrogant, tyrannical, obstinate, half crazy, wild, incomprehensible old fanatic. More than a few observers sense there was an element of jealousy in her animity towards the people's William. He was always more liked than she was. When Gladstone won the 1880 general election, she announced to the world she would abdicate the throne rather than accept him as prime minister. Then offered two other liberal grandees the job who insisted Gladstone had to take it. Then she tried to force him to weed out the members of cabinet she didn't like. He refused. Her interventions failed to prevent her cabinets from achieving what they were determined to do, but she could wear them down. One of her prime ministers said handling her was like having a whole separate government department to deal with. But she just wasn't a pious wife or an eccentric widow. Queen Elizabeth was also a bad mama. Let's get it straight in clean cut, open, honest terms. Victoria did not like children, but she loved the act of making them, especially with Albert. Unfortunately, she was wildly fertile, so you want one of those things. In those days, you got the other thing. She definitely seemed to be one of the women who lacked inherent biological maternal instinct. That's never a flaw, ladies. You aren't broken, just so you know. Because intercourse during pregnancy was believed to harm babies back then, it meant for the better part of a year she'd be banned from intercourse or even cuddling with Albert. The two things she wanted more than kids. It's honestly quite fair from her position that she resented her children between being deprived of her husband, not wanting children in the first place, and lacking a maternal drive. Victoria, we should remember, didn't also have much of an experience of a family life and she was raised under isolated conditions. Victoria in many respects was an awful mother as a result. She couldn't help but view her nine children as functional extensions of herself, expecting unquestioning obedience and was bullying them about their failings. When Bertie, the future Edward IV, rebelled against the rigid system his parents devised for him, she called him backwards and lazy. And when Victoria, who had decided Beatrice would be the unmarried companion of her old age and forbade mentions of weddings in her presence, learned her daughter was secretly engaged, she was so angry she refused to speak to her for six months. She only relented when Beatrice agreed to live with her after they were married. This ain't just some fun and games, this is the Baccarat scandal. Queen Victoria's son, the future King Edward IV, was a notorious playboy and hedonist. His passions included eating, banging, and gambling, with the latter landing him in very hot water in 1891. It starts with a game of Baccarat during a party at the country home of a shipping millionaire. One of the players was Sir William Gordon Cumming, another infamous playboy who was once described as possibly the most handsome man in London, but certainly the rudest. Gordon Cumming was alleged to have cheated during the Baccarat game, an accusation he angrily denied. So as toddy British gents, they have a tea and a chat and come up with an agreement that all players would say nothing of this grave offence if Gordon Cumming signed a declaration promising to never play cards again as long as I live. Not a hard ask. You know, he signed it for nothing, much to Gordon Cumming's annoyance, the story did leak and became a high society gossip. And like a toddy British gent, Gordon Cumming decided to sue, 
several of the background players for slander. The trial was a media circus, the future king appearing in the witness box and society ladies watching through their little opera glasses. Gordon Cumming did lose the case, however the public was largely sympathetic to him and resented Edward for his part in the whole ugly affair. The prince became deeply unpopular for a time and was even booed at Ascot the same month. Another child of Elizabeth's caused a media circus that had her mama reeling, it's the scandal coded daughter. Princess Louise seemed to rebel from the moment she came into the world. She was an exceptional learner, talented, intelligent, artistic, big on women's rights movement, and the most beautiful of Victoria's four daughters. Although an artistic career, or in the words of Victoria, any career, was not appropriate for a princess let alone a woman, the queen allowed Louise to attend art school and later the National Art Training School. Now on to the nasty. Historians assert that Louise had an affair with her brother's tutor. Some accounts say she fell in love with him in the years of 1866 to 1870, but it's not determined if anything physical occurred or if it was just a real big crush. Hearing of Louise's infatuation for a man 14 years her senior, the queen quickly dismissed him. Louise, after a couple years, had an affair with the tutor, Walter Sterling, and she purportedly gave birth to his child. As soon as Louise gave birth, the queen arranged for the boy's adoption by the royal gynecologist, Frederick Lowcock. There's no documentation to uphold it. Why would they keep that? They're trying to hide it. Louise served as an unofficial secretary for her mother from 1966 to 1871 and worked closely with the queen's assistant, private secretary, Arthur Big. Rumor has it that these two had an affair. Yet the most scandalous rumor about Louise surfaced at the death of the famed sculptor Joseph Edgar Bohm. Tales spread of him dying in her arms as they made love. In 1890, Louise married a dashing John Campbell. They did have an unhappy marriage, no children, and grew apart. At this point, Louise became romantically linked to Edward Luton's Colonel William Prober and an unnamed musician master pissing off her mom all along the way. And because her children weren't causing Victoria enough problems, then came the Cleveland Street Scandal. One of the most sordid scandals connected with the royals unfolded in 1889 when a post officer messenger was investigated on suspicion of theft because he was discovered to be in the possession of 14 shillings he could not have earned doing that job. The troubled youth is pressured to admit he had earned it in a male brothel. Bit of a big info drop seeing as homosexuality was super illegal back then. The son of Albert Edward is named Albert Eddie Victor and was second in line to the throne of England at the time. At 21 years of age, he attended Trinity College where he made friends with Oscar Browning, a man known to favor attractive male undergraduates and was also connected to said male brothel the police just found out about. When the police uncovered then questioned those working in the brothel, apparently some names came out. Eddie. His father intervened in the investigation and and no evidence against Eddie could be found or proven. That and the Cleveland Street investigation led to some working boys being given suspiciously light sentences. So there's press speculation that the indescribably loathsome scandal was being swept under the carpet to protect some high ranking visitors to the house. One VIP linked with the brothel was Lord Henry Arthur Somerset, the head of the stables. The next year, Eddie became ill with what may have been venereal disease. Doctors in attendance referred to it as fever and rumors spread of Eddie's intimate relations with a chorus girl of the Gaiety Theatre, Lydia Manton, and later chorus girl, Maud Richardson. The royal family reportedly paid off Maud for her silence. Shortly after, Eddie proposed to Mary of Tech, and she accepted to great relief of the royal family. But the wedding never happens. He succumbs to influenza pandemic in 1889-92, to and he developed pneumonia and died very shortly after his 28th birthday. Whether or not he was part of the Cleveland Street brothel scandal, we'll never truly know. And our first irrational nut coming in at number 10 is The Animal. It's never a good sign when a mother's dying words are somebody bring me a sword and cut me open to see how this animal came out of me. Also never good that she's dying because of her son. But when it came to the Leo Song dynasty, they love two things, killing their own family and killing everyone else's family. So it starts with how this kid, Kian Fei, is a prisoner to his uncle as a child and a bunch of real creepy uncool grooming stuff happens. So his dad kills his uncle to set Kian Fei free. You think he'd be grateful, but Kian Fei showed his gratitude when he became emperor at the age of 15, and his first move was to make all of his dad's portraits have cartoonishly large noses. Oh, oh, and he did get rid of every law his father had ever made, all at once, and immediately, so it threw the country into a literal effing purge. While that's going on, Kian proceeds to start picking off family and staff members in an exceedingly violent manner. E.G., the nobleman whose eyes Kian Fei scooped out, put in a jar of honey, and called his pick a little ghost eye. The servant he killed because she looked like a woman in a dream he died in. He left some of his uncles alive, but put them in cages on display. Healthy, this, this all feels very healthy. Especially when you add in the depraved, lustrous behavior, ordering female relatives to have intercourse in front of him, and then 
and killing those who refused. So I feel it goes without saying he wasn't on the throne for long. Kianfe gets smoked relatively quickly, not by family, not by the military, not by nobility. He was killed by a group of his attendants. Just to drive that home, a group of servants killed the emperor and nobody objected. It was just a lot of, okay, yeah, yeah, all right, we can work with that. No, 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 you guys ain't in trouble. Take the day off. So with the entire family pretty much dead, one caged uncle is put on the throne and he promptly killed every family member that was left, except for his young nephew who succeeded him, only to be killed immediately by a general. And then the general began the Qi Dynasty. Now on to number nine for our favorite lunatic and the terrible tantrums. This whole video could have all just been SARS. These rulers were raised under conditions that guarantee to make anyone a sociopath. Ivan the Terrible's father died when Ivan was only three, and his mother was poisoned when he was eight. During his younger years, corrupt noblemen governed the land and starved, beat, and neglected Ivan and his brother. He, in turn, took his anger out on small animals which he would throw off of the roofs of palaces. Good practice for that time as a teenager when he pimp walked his ass into the throne room, chokeholded the nobleman leader, and physically threw the man to his trained and hungry hunting dogs. You think that's bad? Psycho behavior lightning round baby, let's go. So when Ivan suspected a nobleman wanted the throne, he dressed the man as the king, put him on the throne, and gutted him there. Ivan created a special police force that dog heads hanging from their saddles and could kill anyone at any time in public. Once when Ivan heard a rumor that a town called Novogard was rebellious, he killed every single person in the town and then sewed the town's archbishop up inside a bear skin like this is the end scene of Midsommar and as dogs hunt the archbishop bearmen down. It's hard to write all that and then use the phrase conditions deteriorated, but somehow conditions deteriorated. He was known to spend hours banging his face against the stone floor found in front of religious icons. What truly changed history, however, is he goes after his pregnant daughter-in-law. His actions cause her miscarriage and his son, also named Ivan, berates his father. His father then beats his head in with a scepter, immediately ending the ancient Rurik line of nobility. With the only strong heir to the throne dead, Russia descended into chaos after Ivan's death, and at last nobles could place a family of their choice on the throne, an heir called Michael Romanov. Okay, it's lady time. Number eight is religious mania Maria. Maria of Portugal, unlike pretty much everyone else on this list, had an idyllic childhood. Her father, the king of Portugal, paid a massive amount of attention to both her and her sisters. But while the king was winning dad of the year, his minister, the Marquis of Pombal, managed the country, which apparently meant imprisoning everyone who questioned him and killing anyone left over. I'll give him credit for still being loyal to the king, however, when someone tried to smoke said king, the Marquis rounded up his strongest political enemies, tormented them into confessions, broke their bones on a scaffold, and then burned the scaffold down. Unfortunately, that genetic religious mania starts kicking her ass pretty hard once Maria is in her early 20s. Naturally, this is also when she ascended to the throne, and the horrific actions of the Marquise in the name of her father convinced Maria that he is in hell for being a bad king and she would join him. To alleviate her guilt, she amnestied all the political prisoners and gave them positions in her court. Super sweet gesture, but spending decades in an 18th century Portugal's palace prison does not do much for the mind. So, most of these counselors and courtiers were absolutely insane. When within the space of a year, her eldest son her only living daughter and her two closest ministers all died, Maria completely fell apart. Some days she would embrace the fact that she's already damned, talking in a unchaste manner. Some days she would pace the hall screaming. Her 26-year-old second son is made regent, but he was dead useless with no ability to reform an entire court of lunatics. Naturally, this meant the country was in no shape to meet Napoleon in 1807, so when he marched on him, the entire family fled to Brazil and Portugal became Napoleon's. Number seven is how one man changed the line of succession for the psychologist wife. Peter the Great was, in many ways, a wonderful sovereign. Passionately committed to both his country and his own education, he spent much of his imprisoned childhood learning army tactics and designing ships. As an adult, he toured Europe, learning about the latest advances in science so that he could bring them back to Russia. Peter the Great was pretty great. But like many with great intellect, he'd take it and his impatience with those who didn't understand it a little too far. When he was learning dentistry, he would practice on nobles without their consent. When a group of attendants were upset while watching the dissection of a corpse, he ordered them to walk up to the corpse and take a bite out of it. His childhood traumas also made him fanatical about loyalty because Peter was the child of the former Tsar's second wife and had to watch the relatives of the first wife throw his family off a roof. Peter became so serious about this loyalty, he had his own son tormented to death for temporarily fleeing to Sweden. One person he trusted though was his wife, Catherine. Catherine was a Cinderella story that emerged from a horror movie. Eventually, she met the Tsar who became enthralled with her and Peter had fits of terror due to seeing his family being 
getting tossed off the roof as a kid, and during those fits, Catherine was the only one who could soothe him. So, with his love of loyalty and pride and family, Peter decreed that the Tsar should be able to name his own successor. And that's exactly what Catherine was when Peter died. For number six is two for one, a king and a queen. Let's call it the creation of Catherine. Hilariously, this couple's names were also Peter and Catherine, but unlike the previous set, who loved each other, these two were flighty nightmares. Peter was a bit delayed, with no parental contact and a crap upbringing, the dude developed into a creepy blend of child and sociopath. He didn't consummate the marriage to Catherine literally ever. This poor girl gets shipped from Germany to play toy soldiers in bed with him for nine years. He also tormented animals in training a pack of hunting dogs by beating them and conducting military trials and hangings for the rats he found eating his toys. This guy's brain was so pea-sized that knowing the king liked watching fire, a minister set his own house alight to keep the king distracted while Catherine was giving birth to their definitely illegitimate child. While most crazy Tsars kept their throne for illogically long, Peter got deposed pretty damn fast. Why? He was crazy like a Prussian, not like a Russian. He was meant to be the Swedish heir, and he was raised to dislike Russia. Smoking Peter meant it was time for a lady leader, and Catherine, who was actually born in Prussia, had spent the first few years of her marriage vigorously Russianizing herself and cultivating the Russian army, who preferred a Prussian that had decided she was Russian to a Russian that decided he was Prussian. Number five, we finally leave Russia onto France, who signed up for centuries. Centuries of what? BS, you're in for a ride. So. Charles IV was the king for effing ever. During that time, a united, prosperous, and powerful country fell into civil war and chaos. Charles began having spells not too long after his brother thought it would be funny to light all the king's friends on fire while they're dressed as wild men, which for some reason incorporated tar. Charles became convinced he was made of glass and would shatter if he moved too quickly. So he would hardly move for hours on end. He became incoherent and paranoid. During these spells, Louis, his brother, became the de facto king. This made him a formidable opponent. Anyone who who would make a move to weaken the Count of Valois would find a month or so later they were the enemy of the acting king of France. One night, John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, decided to put an end to Looney Lewis. He hired a group of conspirators to hack him to death in the street, which they did, but while still wearing their work uniforms like it's goddamn amateur hour. So it's not long before people found out exactly who killed Lewis and the nation falls into civil war. John the Fearless went to the English for military support, which they happily gave him in exchange for land in France. Charles the Mad had to declare a, an English king the heir of France to help end the drama. But the treaty doesn't hold because of turmoil in English court, and it gives England and France an excuse to go to war for what? The next hundred years? Number four is our girl, the last empress of China. A little luck gets her journey started. As a low-ranking concubine to the emperor, she gave birth to the emperor Xiang Fang's only son in 1856, a feat his wife, the empress, couldn't have accomplished. The emperor immediately raised her status, gave her a privileged life, and made her son, Emperor Tongzi, the heir. After Xiang Fang died, when her son was just six, the new empress Sichi orchestrated a coup grabbing the power from a council of elders. Once Tongzi ascended, Sichi became a empress dowager and a unusually powerful joint ruler. After Tongzi died very suddenly without an heir, Siji had a backup ready and installed her four-year-old nephew. This consolidated her power yet again, and she served as the de facto leader of the vast king empire in, from 1861 until she died in 1908. During her reign, she stomped out rebellions, civil wars, and supported the self-strengthening movement, a period of institutionalization, economic, and military reforms, which helped transform China from an aged society into a more modern modern superpower on a global scale. Now over to the Ottomans for number three, which will be coming out of the cage be doing not so fine. Our tale begins with a group of brothers, the most prominent among them being Ahmed the first and Mustafa. Ahmed puts his brother Mustafa in the cage, a tower with no windows, a brick wall built over the door, and no human contact. Don't be scared, guys. This is what all Ottoman empires did with their siblings. They also disfigured their faces sometimes. Pick your poison. So Ahmed craps out a few sons, then drops at the age of 28. So out of the cage, Mustafa came, 14 years after being put into basically an above ground pit. What could go wrong? Well, you can argue it's kind of odd. He walked around with two naked servant girls at all times, but the real problem was he had a habit of giving important positions to random people he met in life. Without a strong organized central government, the empire started to crumble. Back in the cage you go, but with two women this time. He was replaced by Ahmed's oldest son, Osman. The young man might have made a decent ruler, but he banned drinking and smoking and intercourse in the army. Do I need to explain the problem? Anyways, they sentenced him to death via the boy crusher, which you can learn about in my video, the top 
had brutal punishment from the Ottoman Empire. Out of the cage came Mustafa again, and at this point he had a habit of sitting and giggling to himself. In between giggle fits, he'd go out around looking for his dead nephew, forgetting the man was dead, and when he was told he had other ones, he'd kill them. He also went back to his old tricks, appointing random people to important positions, and the officials in the provinces were one step away from declaring themselves local kings. Put a cap on thing, the Safavid Persian Empire attacked and grabbed what's now Iraq. Back into the cage, Mustafa went. Still in the Ottoman Empire, number two is bankruptcy and a two-decade war. Someone had to succeed the cage man, and that was what Murad IV did, one of the nephews that Mustafa hadn't killed. Maybe because the dude was ruthless. His last act before dying was ordering the death of his last surviving brother. He had nothing against Ibrahim, but he needed, he simply believed that their line was cursed by madness and needed to be annihilated. Sadly, for 279 women, as you'll learn, Ibrahim's mother successfully pleads for his life. Ibrahim spends his entire life in the cage with only occasional contact with people. He came out with what can be tactically described as a lust for life. Made frantic by years of deprivation, he acquired everything like an animal, including 280 concubines in a harem. One day, he saw a cow's hoo-ha and had a cast made of it and circulated it through the empire for a woman that matched. When he found her, she became his favorite concubine and he named her Sugar Lump. Sugar didn't care for competition, so she told the psychotically jealous Ibrahim that one of the other women in the harem was unfaithful, but only she didn't know which one. Ibrahim's answer was having all 280 tied up in sacks and thrown into the Bosphorus River. Only one survived when her sack came undone and she was taking aboard a French freighter bound for Paris. What finally did Ibrahim in was fanatically acquiring all the golden jewels he could, pulling from temples and threatening ministers. Then Ibrahim started a war with Venice. He soon couldn't pay the Janissaries and they sent him back to the cage. The war with Venice outlasted him by 22 years. And last but never least, number one is the Bumper Car King, aka the story of how Justin II lost half of Italy while playing bumper cars. Yeah, real story. Evidently, he joins pretty much every monarch on this list as having their formative years isolated and terrified of sudden violent death. He doesn't help being a Biazetine heir and having your parents be the notorious couple Justinian and Theodora. Eventually, all their heirs run out except for Justin. Justin, who inherits a pretty crappy situation, seeing as his dad's foreign policy was to expand military as far as he could and then pay his new neighbors not to attack him. And shocker, tribute costs a lot. Unfortunately, the empire was going through some tough financial times and Justinian had been borrowing to cover his an annual payment. Justin believed he could do better by just refusing to pay the Persians while pitting the tribes in the north against each other. It was then under the strain of multiple nearing armies that Justin had a nervous breakdown. Ministers would be asking him what to do and he'd claim to hear voices and then climb under his bed to escape them. On bad days he would violently grab at people, biting them on the arms or the face. Legend has it that he literally ate a couple servants. In desperation and self-preservation, the servants tried to think of a couple ways to keep the emperor distracted from eating them, so they came up with the throne on wheels. Servants raced him around the halls of the palace on the throne, trying to keep him amused with the speed. When he had guests, they'd also get to experience zooming around on wheeled seats, aka bumper cars. In the end, Justinian II fared pretty well perhaps better than he deserved considering his last words as emperor were complaints about his servants. Number 10, Charlie Chaplin. This might have been the biggest shocker to me today. I had no idea he married and had relations with so many girls under the age of 20 when he was uh, much older than them. So in 1918, for starters, Chaplin hastily tied the knot with 17-year-old uh, actress Mildred Harris, a decision he would soon come to regret, saying they were irreconcilably mismatched. Following the divorce, he married 16-year-old Lita Gray, another actress with whom he had a bitter breakup. From the first day of marriage, he made his perception about her clear and called her a little ooh whore. I hope you get what I'm saying there. On their train back to California from the marriage, Chaplin suggested Lita jump off the train to end her misery. Interestingly, Chaplin didn't like his wife, but according to her, he remained a human s machine. When she announced she was pregnant for the second time, his behavior got even more erratic. He would take up to eight showers a day and monitor the listening devices he had installed in her bedroom and patrol their house's grounds with a pistol at night. By the end of the same year, Lita headed for a divorce, stating how Chaplin had uh, pulled that same piece at her and threatened getting rid of her, what she had. Lita's more elaborated passages surfaced when she claimed how throughout the marriage life, Chaplin forced her to gratify his abnormal, unnatural, perverted, and degenerate sexual desires. 
Next on his list was 22 year old actress Paulette Goddard. History doesn't have an exact record of the year they married, but she moved into his mansion and got cast as a leading actress in modern times. Charlie bullied her on sets, a primary reason for their separation, telling people how he had to teach her things about acting, and those remarks would leave her crying. And in 1943, while in the middle of a high profile paternity suit, 54 year old Chaplin married 18 year old Una O'Neill, to whom he had been introduced by a Hollywood agent. O'Neill's father, playwright Eugene O'Neill, was so upset by the match that he disinherited her. But unlike his other relationships, this one actually lasted. The two stayed together until Chaplin's death at age 88, and they had eight descendants. Jeez, that's a lot of marriages. I'm technically cheating a little bit on the history word here, since Tom Cruise is one of the most recent names on this list, but I couldn't leave a high ranking Scientology member off of the uh, evil list. He has allegedly reached OT8, which is the highest currently achievable level of the cult. Uh, pardon me. As always, I'm getting ahead of myself. Scientology is a set of beliefs and practices invented by Ron Hubbard, who developed a set of ideas that he called Dianetics, which he represented as a form of therapy, an organization that he established in 1950 to promote it went bankrupt, and he lost the rights to his book in 1952. Too. But he then recharacterized his ideas as a religion for tax purposes and renamed them Scientology. By 1954, he had regained the rights to Dianetics and founded the Church of Scientology, which remains the largest organization promoting the cult. In 1967, he established a new elite group, the Sea Organization, or Sea Org for short, the membership of which was drawn from the most committed members of the church. By 1981, the 21-year-old David Miscavige, who had been one of his closest aides in Sea Org, rose to prominence. Now, Hubbard died at his ranch in Creston, California on January 24th of 1986, and Miscavige succeeded him as the head of the church, a position he holds till this day. It was actually at Tom Cruise's wedding day, to now ex-wife Katie Holmes, that people started realizing that Miscavige's wife Shelly was missing, and when a former Scientology member started asking around, she was punished for asking. There are just too many evil things about the cult for me to talk about right now, but you just gotta know that to be that high ranking at a cult, you gotta be evil. Number 8. Steve Jobs While I love and appreciate my iPod and the iPhones I've had over the years, Steve Jobs was no saint. In fact, his success can be attributed to his ruthless behavior, which is kind of commonplace with anybody that makes a billion dollars. In his biography, there are plenty of examples, from firing people at Pixar without notice, to storming out of a five-star hotel that he thought wasn't up to his standards, and berating service workers that he didn't consider up to his standards. Now, while that's all icky, you might be asking where the actual evil is, and don't worry, there's plenty. For starters, he not only neglected his daughter, Lisa Brennan Jobs, who he had with an ex-girlfriend, but he was also just like straight up rude and weird to her. Her In her memoir, Small Fry, she painted him like a jerk who once told her that she smelled like a toilet. However, the creepiest revelation was when Lisa revealed that Steve liked making out with his new wife right in front of her. So in the book, she describes Steve pulling in his wife for a kiss, moving his hand closer to her breasts while moaning theatrically, and when Lisa tried to excuse herself, Steve stopped her and told her to stay since they were having, in his words, a family moment. It's important that you try to be part of this family. Okay. Moving on before I hurl. Probably his biggest evil moment though was when he cheated his friend and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak out of money. While the two worked together at Atari, Steve asked his partner to build a scaled down version of Breakout, saying they would split the profits. And after four sleepless nights, Wozniak finished the game and got a whopping $350 for it. He later learned that Steve had lied to him about how much money he made from the game and had actually pocketed most of the profits for himself. Honestly, that's the stuff movie villains get based on. Number seven, Albert Einstein. After you invent the theory of relativity, I guess Yes, you can get away with being like a little bit of a jerk, and Albert definitely was. From being incredibly racist against Asians in his travel journals to being a serial adulterer. Travel diaries he wrote during a months long voyage in the 1920s reveal that in his private moments, the Nobel winning physicist portrayed people of other races, such as, you know, Chinese and Indians, in a stereotypical dehumanizing way. His unfiltered musings about the people he saw and interacted with during his journey show that, you know, eh, he harbored some pretty racist about those who didn't look like him. His reflections about the Chinese folks were callous, even insulting. Although he called them industrious, he also described them as filthy and obtuse. He claimed that they were a peculiar, herd-like nation, often more like automatons than people. He saw them as intellectually inferior, quoting that the Chinese are incapable of being trained to think logically and have no talent for mathematics. He was also not the nicest of folks he allegedly loved, having created a baffling to-do list for his first wife, Maleva Mark. This list included rules such as, you will see to it that my clothes and linen are kept in order, that I am served three regular meals a day in my room, and you will expect no affection from me. You must leave my bedroom or study at once without protesting when I ask you to. Hard pass. Number six, John Hamm. 
Oh, the handsome Mad Max star has a lot of female fans that love his charm, but the actor, kind of like his famous character, is pretty good at hiding his dark side. In 2015, news broke that the former frat boy was in the middle of a violent hazing ritual in 1991 where he allegedly set a guy on fire. Not only did John beat up a pledge by punching him in the kidney, he also let the poor guy around the frat house with a claw of a hammer beneath his genitals. As for the pledge, the whole experience made him sink into a deep depression, which sadly makes sense. This broke my heart, because like until today, I very much enjoyed watching him on screen, but I guess I'll be able to villain and better in Sucker Punch now. Number five, Bill Cosby. It emerged in late 2014 that the famed actor, formerly known as America's Dad, sexually harmed dozens of women throughout his career. Cosby was accused by over 60 women of bad things that I can't word. The earliest incidents allegedly took place in the mid-1960s, but dates of the alleged incidents continue all the way up to 2008 in 10 U.S. states and in one Canadian province. Now, Cosby has maintained his innocence and repeatedly denied the allegations made against him. Most of the alleged acts fall outside the statute of limitations for criminal legal proceedings, but criminal charges were filed against him in one case, and numerous civil lawsuits were brought against him. As of November 2018, I believe eight related silver suits were active. In July of 2015, some court records were unsealed and released to the public from a specific civil suit, and a full transcription of its deposition was released by a court reporting service. In his testimony, Cosby admitted to casual sex involving recreational use of the sedative quaaludes with a series of young women, and he acknowledged that his dispensing of the prescription drug was illegal. In December of that year, three Class II felony charges of aggravated indecent harm were filed against Cosby in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, based on allegations concerning incidents in January of 04. Now, Cosby was found guilty of three counts of aggravated indecent harm at retrial on April 26th of 2018, and on September 25th of the same year, he was sentenced to 3 to 10 years in state prison and fined $25,000 plus the cost of the prosecution. So, 43000 something? In 2014, Judy Huth filed a civil suit against Cosby in California, alleging that he had her in 1975 when she was too young to consent. That trial began in 2022, and thankfully the jury ruled in Huth's favor. So, good riddance. Number four, Elvis. Although everyone knows he famously met wife Priscilla Presley when she was only 14, that wasn't the only time he fraternized with folks that were a little too young. According to a former member of his entourage, Elvis was fascinated with the idea of real young girls. He was particularly obsessed with Virginia ones, which he called cherries, and excuse me while I retch. According to Baby Let's Play House, Elvis felt insecure about pleasing older woman and would invite groups of young fans to his house for sleepovers instead. And once he met Priscilla, those fantasies didn't change. Determined to keep her Virginia until their wedding day, uh, he would instead have role play sessions where she would dress up like a schoolgirl and he would dress up like a teacher. Once the two married and had their first spawn, however, Escapade stopped. Priscilla wrote in her memoir that Elvis had mentioned to her before they were married that he had never been able to make love to a woman who had given birth. When Elvis finally upgraded to adult woman, dating 21-year-old beauty queen Ginger Eldon after his divorce from Priscilla, he continued to treat them like crap. Ginger wrote in her memoir that Elvis once fired a pistol into her bedroom when she refused to bring him yogurt. Lovely. Number three, Vlad the Impaler. Also known as Vlad Dracula, he was Prince of Wallachia three times between 1448 and his death in around 1476 or 77. The character of Dracula was loosely based on Vlad due to his sadistic personality and cruel acts done to the people of Wallachia, where he reigned as prince three times between 1448 to 1462 and killed about, oh, only 20% of the population. Works containing the stories about Vlad's cruelty were published in Low German in the Holy Roman Empire before 1480. They described Vlad as a demented psycho path, a gruesome killer, and a masochist Caligula and Nero. One tale explains that Vlad had a big copper cauldron built and put a lid made of wood with holes in it on top. He put people in the cauldron and put their heads in the holes and fastened them there. He then filled it with water and set a fire under it and let people cry their eyes out until they were boiled to death. And you know, he invited just overall frightening, terrible, unheard of punishments. He ordered that women be impaled together with their suckling young on the same stake, stuck on their mother's breasts until they died. Then he had the woman's breast cut off and put the little ones inside head first, thus he had them impaled together. He impaled victims through the um, rear end till the steak came out of their mouth. A German pamphlet once read that he had young folks roasted, and then he would feed them to their mothers, and he cut off the breasts of women and forced their husbands to eat them. You know, nightmare cruelty. Number two, Hugh Hefner. While it might not seem shocking that the man who claimed woman empowerment came from seeing them in bunny suits through the male gaze, you know, being a bad guy, just how awful he was may raise some eyebrows. He manipulated and drugged dozens of young women into taking part in degrading act, while masquerading as a champion of freedom. He would also host weekly pig nights, during which he would bring in a dozen Schmex workers he considered ugly to have friends. Holly Madison, you know, a lovely woman who dated Hefner for eight years, told how Hefner refused to use protection during 
and how the Playboy Bunny lifestyle had her considering taking her own life. Linda Lovelace, the 1970s um, adult video star who found fame with the film Deep Throat, said she was treated like a piece of meat and forced to perform oral. German Shepherd while Hefner and his friends watched. I could go into more detail, but I don't think I want to. Number one, Gandhi. Yeah, sure, he was an activist who led India to independence, but it also turns out that he was kind of a in the book The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, it was revealed that Gandhi was a separatist who wrote to the natal parliament that general belief seems to prevail in the colony that the Indians are a little better, if at all, than savages or the natives of Africa. He later wrote to a health officer in Johannesburg that he was concerned about the mixing of the South Africans with the Indians. If that wasn't awful enough, he frequently used his power to take advantage of young women in their late teens and early 20s. His inappropriate behavior was so bad, it caused his personal secretary, R.P. Paris Suram to blast him in a strongly worded letter. Now, his secretary gave him an ultimatum. Either stop manhandling women or I'm not working for you anymore. And Gandhi responded by telling him that uh, you're at liberty to leave. Yucky. Number 10, Joseph Mengele. All right, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. This man is the only entry from the Second World War on today's list. And that's mainly because online guidelines make it practically impossible for me to talk about the evil German dictator or members of his party. So also known as the Angel of Death, Dr. Joseph was an anthropologist and SS physician who conducted numerous inhumane medical experiments on the prisoners at Auschwitz. So at Auschwitz, he was one of a number of medical professionals who selected victims to be sentenced to the gas chambers or be spared for his experimental research. He would attempt red fluid transfusions from one twin to another, do amputations to try and sew that part onto another twin, stitch two twins together to form Siamese twins, infect one twin with typhus or another disease, and uh, way too many other experiments. Can you tell he liked twins? And to the surprise of no one, more often than not, the twins would pass away during the procedures, or you know, he would just have them killed afterwards so he could do an autopsy for funsies. If one twin died from a disease, yeah, the other one's going just to mark the differences between the sick and healthy subjects. The evil doctor was also very interested in heterochromia, where people have irises of different colors, and he would uh, collect eyes and body parts of his victims and send it off for research. He would inject chemicals in victims' eyes to attempt to change their eye color. Now remember, this was before the age of colored contacts. He also experimented on pregnant women before sending them off to the gas chambers and caused incestuous pregnancies, always under the guise of research. Now he tried sex change operations, he tried removing organs, and operating on victims without anesthesia. Oh, and if that wasn't disgusting enough, he tried to prove that Jewish and Romani people were genetically inferior through his morbid experimentation. Throughout his time at Auschwitz, Joseph sent his colleagues in Germany red fluid, body parts, organs, skeletons, and even fetuses that have been taken from prisoners. Yay. Number 9, Putin. Well, Vladimir Putin started off reasonably well, you know, in his career, although there are um, some stories that his cronies planted explosives in Russian apartment buildings to help him snatch that presidency back in 1999. Granted, the folks who tell those truths keep going missing, so I'll get the Cliffs Notes version and pray I don't get nuked on the spot. One month after then President Boris Yeltsin plucked Putin from obscurity, oh and by the way, he was a KGB official at the time, which, yeesh, and made him Prime Minister, an explosion leveled a nine-story apartment building on Moscow's outskirts. Sidebar, if you don't know what the KGB was other than me shuddering just now, they were a security agency that make all the other ones in the world look like young folks trying to enforce rules for funsies. The pre-dawn blast on September 9th of 1999 reduced the building to a smoking pile of rubble, killing more than 100 people. A second building, less than 600 kilometers away, was rocked by an explosion on September 13th, killing 119 this time. Days earlier, a car exploded in a small town bordering the war-ravaged region of Chechnya, where reignited fighting was already spilling into neighboring regions. That blast outside the apartment building in the town of Buynask killed dozens. If I got the name wrong, I apologize. I'm not the best with every language. French and English are my forte for a reason. It was followed seven days later by a truck explosive that destroyed a nine-story building in another southern city, killing 17. On September 23rd, Putin asserted to the, you know, everybody, that bad guys in Chechnya were to blame and ordered a massive air campaign within the North Caucasus region. When asked a day later about the campaign targeting what he called terrorists, Putin responded with the phrase that will forever be his catchphrase. We will pursue them everywhere. We'll catch them in the toilet. We'll wipe them out in the outhouse. The statement became a Putin catchphrase and uh, set the tone for the 20 years of rule that followed. The longer he's in power, the more evil he's become. Leveling Grozny, attacking Georgia, grabbing the Crimea, carpet kabooming in Syria, imprisoning, poisoning, and assassinating any opponents and, you know, muzzling the free press. One one would think, you know, oh, it can't get worse. Yeah, he had another surprise. 
the unprovoked attack of Ukraine, which, you know, an independent and peaceful nation back in February of 2022. But thanks to the heroism of the Ukrainian people, it's not completely the walkover he expected. So fingers crossed he maybe gets uh, voted out in the next election. Granted, it's a little tricky when people who oppose him have that weird coincidental habit of going missing. Number 8. Korean Kims It's pretty difficult to distinguish between these two evil leaders, father and son, of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's a country led by a dictator where the people have no say, and a monarchy with the father being succeeded by the son. Over time, there's actually been three Kims in that family that suggests that uh, being evil might just be like a generational thing, you know, part of your genetics, kind of like having an oily nose is one of mine. Under Papa Kim Yong II, aka the dear leader, which is a bucket of irony I don't have time to unpack, millions of folks died because of food scarcity. Amnesty International condemned him for leaving millions of North Koreans in poverty and detaining hundreds of thousands of people in prison camps, where, yeah, a lot of them died. Now, baby-faced Kim Jong-un was not much of an improvement. Human rights are non-existent, and his true or imagined opponents, or people he just doesn't like, are killed with methods that are going to give me nightmares for the rest of the year. While the general population suffers, the Kims spend whatever money they have on the development of nuclear weapons, because, you know, why not just make things worse? Number 7. Dr. Phil First, it's very important to understand that Dr. Phil is not a real doctor anymore. While he does have a PhD in psychology and used to have a license, he is no longer a licensed psychologist and cannot legally practice in the state of California, where he lives and films a show. Now, emphasis on used to. Look, while I can't state with certainty why he is no longer licensed, if you go back to 1988, a decade before his first appearance on Oprah, a 19-year-old client of his alleged that he carried on an unprofessional sexual relationship with her, would touch her inappropriately, and intentionally kept her totally dependent on him. The Texas State Board of Examiners of Psychologists, try saying that five times fast, investigated the accusations, along with claims that Dr. Phil inappropriately provided this young lady with part-time temporary employment while still carrying on a therapeutic relationship. Their findings never referenced the accusations of sexual misconduct, but they did discover that the doctor sustained an improper dual relationship with the client by acting both as her therapist and her employer. The board issued him a letter of reprimand, assigned a psychologist to monitor his practice, and required him to take an ethics class and a complete psychological evaluation. Whatever the reason may be, Phil McGraw is no longer a licensed psychologist and he hasn't been for quite a while. He believes that his show's primary goal is to let people know that it's okay to treat problems and get help, and deliver understandable information about how to live one's life. Which, you know, that's a cute soundbite, no? But Dr. Phil's show regularly exploits people with serious mental illnesses and disabilities for financial and entertainment purposes, if you can even call that entertainment. In one instance, Todd Herzog, a former winner of the hit reality TV show Survivor, appeared on the show in 2013 to discuss his drinking problem. However, he was so drunk that he had to be carried onto the set and lifted into a chair. Before you wonder why a supposedly trained psychologist is something so cruel as to put a man too drunk to walk on national TV, first consider the horrendously immoral and unethical actions that led to this situation. According to Herzog, he was set up. His dressing room came with a full bottle of, um, spicy juice. After drinking all of it, a staff member supposedly handed him a Xanax, which he took before he even went on stage. Which, all of this doesn't even scrape the surface of the accusations of misconduct and bad psychology that have followed Dr. Phil throughout his career. If I were to say all of those, I'd be here all day. Number 6. Osama Bin Laden Yeah, he doesn't really need an introduction. Remember 9-11? Yeah, he was the organizer and mastermind, sending himself and way too many innocents to their death. He became America's most wanted, and justice was, you know, finally served on May 2nd of 2011 at 1am. Thank you, Navy C. They also found um, a huge stash of no-no tapes in his compound, because apparently the self-righteous threat persecuting women for being loose was not above sampling the strictly condemned fruits himself. Number 5. Caligula Many Roman emperors can be described as self-centered, but this one's appetite for amusement, decadence, and scarlet elixir were on a whole other level. The emperor's short temper and even shorter attention span resulted in countless deaths of his subjects. Caligula killed people for just Funsies. In one particularly vile uh, situation, he even ordered his guards to put spectators in an arena to be eaten by wild animals because he was bored during a, you know, an intermission. I just lose hours scrolling on TikTok and playing silly games on my phone when I get bored, which, you know, isn't often. The emperor was indulgent and purposely wasted money, which led to starvation amongst his subjects. He openly slept with married women and sold his sisters to other men, which I guess seems kind of mild after having people killed to kill your own boredom, but, you know, simply put, he was scummy. Number 4. Jim Jones As if I was going to do a list of the worst men in history and not include a single cult leader. So back in the 1950s, Indiana native Jim Jones founded the People's Temple, a group that he claimed promoted socialism and equality 
quality with religious elements of Christianity. Now, fast forward to the 1970s, he moved his group to California and set them up in a commune-like settlement in Redwood Valley. After he established several locations throughout the state, including its main headquarters in San Francisco, the temple forged ties with many left-wing political figures and claimed to have 20,000 members, even though 3 to 5,000 is probably more likely. Jones eventually came to believe that nuclear war was imminent and moved his followers again to the South American country of Guyana, which he thought would be outside the potential danger zone. The group lived there for several years as the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but after former members started speaking out against the church, San Francisco Congressman Leo Ryan decided to travel to Jonestown to uh, see what was going on. During his visit, a number of temple members expressed a desire to leave with them and accompanied Leo to the local airstrip at Port Ketuma. There, they were intercepted by self-styled temple security guards who opened fire on the group, killing the congressman, three journalists, and one of the defectors as well as injuring nine others, including Ryan's aide, Jackie Spire. A few seconds of the incident were captured on video by NBC cameraman Bob Brown, one of the journalists that were sadly killed in the attack. But that evening in Jonestown, Jones ordered his congregation to drink a concoction of cyanide-laced, grape-flavored flavorate. Oh, right, this is where the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid comes from, but it actually wasn't Kool-Aid, it was the off-brand stuff. All in all, 918 people died, including 276 miles. When members wept and showed signs of dissent, Jones counseled, Stop the hysterics. This is not the way for people who are socialists or communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. On a tape, Jones can be heard saying, Don't be afraid to die, adding that death is just stepping over into another plane and a friend. Jones directed that the youngest folks be killed first, and his wife Marceline apparently protested against this. Uh, so then she was forcibly restrained and then joined the other adults in poisoning herself. Some members resisted ending their lives and were injected with fatal doses of cyanide, as were those too young to drink the drink and some folks thankfully did survive by fleeing through the jungle. Until 9-11, this was the largest loss of American civilian life in history, which sends a chill down my spine to think about. Number three, Pol Pot. This vile leader of the Khmer Rouge regime was the architect of the Cambodian genocide and devastating policies that led to widespread famine and deaths from preventable diseases. The regime's xenophobic and racist views and policies led to the widespread killings of minorities all throughout Cambodia. The regime also imprisoned and destroyed those who opposed it. Prisoners were subjected to horrific medical experiments, which often resulted in agonizingly drawn out deaths. Many prisoners, including those too young to consent, were executed in the infamous killing fields and buried in mass graves. To save bullets, they were killed with pickaxes or smashed against trees, which is so much worse. Now, Pol Pot and the regime ended the lives of between 1.5 to 2 million Cambodian citizens, a quarter of the country's population. The most mind-boggling part for me is wondering how this wasn't taught in school, or at least my school growing up. Number two, Chris Brown. If y'all don't remember, 14 years ago, on the February 8th of 2009, Brad's reputation was immediately tarnished when he physically harmed his then-girlfriend Rihanna after a pre-Grammys event. At the time, Rihanna was only 20, and she was left with visible injuries to her face and was hospitalized as a result. Now, Chris Brown was 19 at the time, and he pleaded guilty and accepted a deal of 1,400 hours of community service, five years probation, and domestic violence counseling. And look, while folks try to defend him, he wouldn't have made today's list if he was a single instance offender. But let's check the history book, shall we? In 2013, Chris Brown was arrested for felony harm in Washington, D.C. After he and his bodyguard were involved in a physical altercation with two men outside a hotel, the pair spent 36 hours in jail and the singer was ordered to stay at least 100 yards away from the man he was accused of harming. In 2015, Brown allegedly hit a man in Las Vegas after an alleged argument over a basketball game at the Palms Casino Resort. The next year, he was sued by his ex-manager, who filed a lawsuit against him, claiming that he had been viciously attacked. And in 2017, he was ordered to stay away from ex-girlfriend Karushi Tron after she put a five-year restraining order order against the singer. He's been sued by other women for sexual harm as well, so how he still has some sort of a successful career boggles my mind. Number one, Louis B. Mayer. This is one name I didn't even have to look up today. As a lifelong fan of Judy Garland, I've had a bone to pick with him for quite some time. So in front of his staff, Mayer presented a calm, paternal presence. But behind closed doors, he was known for temper tantrums complete with loud sobbing and furious ranting. Most terrifying of all, these rages would go as quickly as they came, and then he would put his icy mask back on. Textbook signs of narcissism. Trust me. Elizabeth Taylor famously clashed with him constantly and dubbed him a monster for the way he tried to rule every detail of her life. Now, some of the worst allegations against Mayer come from Judy Garland. According to her, Mayer frequently groped her and made her sit on his lap. At other times, he would innocently place his hand on her left breast to show her how to sing from the heart. Oh, and this was when she was just a teen. He was particularly awful to Judy, calling her his little hunchback because of her short stature and curved spine and encouraged her to take diet pills to slim down and look less girlish. Thanks in part to his actions, Judy was plagued with eating disorders and insecurities all the way until her tragic early end. Number 10, Mary the First. 
So this is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history as the first woman ever to be, you know, the Queen of England. Instead, she is mostly remembered as B L O O D Y Mary, a name she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to the Reformation. Look, the interwebs don't like the B word, so I had to spell it out. So I'm hoping you figured out what I was trying to say. The most controversial part of her reign was her religious policy. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to reaffirm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear through England, and around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country. I wonder why. In February of 1555, well, um, the uh, executions began. Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Cranmer repented his Protestant faith and technically, under law, he should have been absolved as a repentant, but Mary refused to accept his absolution and had him burned at the stake as well just to, you know, Set an example, or for funsies. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, most of them by burning at the stake simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years, since she passed in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer and was succeeded by Elizabeth I. Number nine, Wu Zetian. Look, I know I said in the title of today that I'd be talking about evil queens, but I support all women's wrongs. And rulers in other countries tend to have different titles to their equivalent of queens. So Wu was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects including writing, music, literature, and perhaps most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. By the age of 14, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor, who became Emperor Gaozong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. I'm not going to unpack that. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly after the birth, it passed, with evidence showing um, strangulation. So Wu accused Empress Wang of the death, and Wang lost favor with the emperor. The most popular theory is that Wu actually uh, did the act to her own daughter. So thereafter, the emperor conferred with his chancellors and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned, and promoted Wu to empress. Later on, the emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this, because you know, can't have any witnesses. Upon her accession to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives, or executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them uh, executed as well, and their families became slaves within the imperial palace. In another incident, she killed her niece with poison, accused two others of the death, and executed them. She eventually passed after repeated bouts with illness, so nothing nefarious there. Number 8, Isabella of Castile. So when Isabella was born on the 22nd of April in 1451, there was little chance she would ever become monarch of Castile, as she was very far removed from the direct royal lineage. War, politics, and subterfuge intervened, however, and for many years, the Kingdom of Spain was in turmoil, suffering from civil wars and uh, a lot of chaos. To quell one of the rebellions, the hand of Isabella was promised to the commoner, Pedro Duran Acuna Pacheco, but on his way to her, he suddenly fell ill and, um, passed. Now, this immensely fortuitous event for Isabella cemented her devotion to her faith, since she didn't exactly want to marry a commoner and prayed for divine intervention. Her marriage to Ferdinand, heir to the thrones of Castile and Aragon, cemented her future power. After the death of the King of Castile, the throne was given to Isabella. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians, which led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and torture of mostly Jewish and Muslim folks. Isabella waged war on the Kingdom of Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last peace to fall in the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as the liberation of Spain, for many others, it was open genocide. By the time Granada was annexed, 100,000 Muslims were either dead or enslaved. Number seven, Catherine de' Medici. I'm chuckling, but I'm glad my obsession with rain in high school is about to come in handy. So serving as the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, Catherine had enormous political sway over her sons, the French kings, Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. They reigned through the French wars of religion and faced problems with a group of Calvinist Protestants 
called the Huguenots. It is widely believed by historians that Catherine attempted to have their leader, Gaspard II de Coligny, assassinated. The attempt failed, and fearing retaliation from the most powerful folks in power, Catherine planned to kill them all before they could take action. The result was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which resulted in the deaths of between, oh, 5,000 to 30,000 Huguenots. Number 6. Lady Elizabeth Bathory Born in 1560 on a family estate in royal Hungary, Elizabeth was of noble lineage and privileged with education, wealth, and a lofty social rank. Her first taste of the morbidly bizarre was introduced to her during the early years of her life when she suffered seizures which might have been epilepsy. Treatment at the time for such bouts included feeding the patient human redness and bits of skull from a non-sufferer. She bore witness to brutal punishments and executions carried out by her father's officers and was influenced by family members involved with Satanism and witchcraft. When she was barely in the double digits of age, Elizabeth was engaged to Count Ferenc Nadassi, who she later married. Her husband spent much of his time away from home fighting the Ottomans, leaving Elizabeth to run the estate. Her Satanism became more pronounced as time wore on, and upon the death of her husband in 1601, her vicious crimes escalated. Most of her victims were girls around the age of the time she got married, and were usually the daughters of lesser gentry who had been sent to court to learn etiquette. Her favorite punishment methods including using pins to stick under her victims' fingernails and covering her victims in honey and leaving them out to be eaten by ants and other insects. Other methods included whipping her victims with nettles and frequently burning body parts, especially genitalia. After burning her victims, she would dump them in icy water. Many of them uh, were punished to the point of death, some of whom were buried in unmarked locations, and some sources even claim she engaged in people munching, making that her darkest secret. Elizabeth and a few of her servants were eventually arrested in 1610, and her accomplices were put on trial in 1611. With over 300 witness accounts and numerous testimonials, a guilty verdict was assured. A servant girl who claims to have seen evidence in Elizabeth's private books stated that her victims were around 650 folks. The accomplices were sentenced to death, and Elizabeth was confined to a bricked up room with slits for air and delivery of food. She was found dead a couple years later. Number 5. Marie Antoinette so France's queen between 1774 and 1792 was Marie Antoinette, who was you know, the last queen before the French Revolution. She had quite the reputation for splurging on expensive things and found herself in quite a few scandals. One in particular was the affair of the diamond necklace. So Countess de Lamotte, a young lady, pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a high society member into believing that Antoinette loved him. She even hired a buy selling worker and disguised her as the queen and convinced the man that uh, Marie wanted to purchase a diamond necklace. The jewelry cost around 1,600,000 livres then, which is almost $12 million today. The money was never paid, and the queen had no clue about what had taken place, but even though she was innocent, the public still despised her. Granted, she's mostly known for her infamous dialogue. When French subjects could not afford bread, she said, let them eat cake, which fueled the French Revolution and ultimately led to her um, execution. Number 4. Queen of Castile So Juana la Loca was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband passed in 1506, her father buried his body. However, Juana used to open the tomb and caress her husband's dead body, and ultimately she ordered the body dug out and kissed her husband's feet. Additionally, she would carry his coffin everywhere with her, and actually kept it under her bed. Years later though, she eventually allowed his burial out at her window. Look, I just keep weird dolls under my bed. Number 3. Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg Maria Eleonora, born on November 11th of 1599, passing eventually on March 28th of 1655, held the title of Queen of Sweden from 1620 to 1632 as the wife of King Gustav II Adolf. Coming from a noble German family, she belonged to the prestigious house of I'm not even going to try and say that. However, when Maria and Gustav gave birth to a girl with a genetic condition causing excessive hair growth, Maria was deeply shocked. The unexpected appearance of her daughter, combined with uh, societal beauty expectations, pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous creature. When Gustav died when Christina was only um, this many years old, Maria blamed her for his death. For over a year, Maria subjected Christina to very harsh punishment, confining her to blacked out, darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for very extended periods, even placing her father's open casket in Christina's room and demanding she sleep next to it, which that's way too morbid. 
even by my standards. Maria's mental state deteriorated, eventually leading to Christina's removal from her custody. So thank goodness for Christina. Number two, Sixty the Dragon Lady. So the story of her rise to power is a remarkable one. Born at a time when Chinese women were politically invisible, this lady managed to acquire enormous political influence by exploiting her position as a royal concubine, engaging in court intrigues and manipulating those around her. By the end of the 1860s, she had become the most powerful individual in China. Her will and her reach even exceeded two male emperors, who she frequently bypassed or overruled. Now, she was originally born Lan Kuo in 1835, the daughter of a minor Manchu official, and at age 15, she was selected as a potential concubine for the emperor and relocated to the Forbidden City. She was elevated to the status of concubine officially by age 18, eventually giving birth to the emperor's only son, Zhechun, a feat that earned her another promotion in the palace hierarchy. The emperor died in 1861, and shortly after the disastrous Second Opium War, left the throne to his only son. So as the mother of the reigning emperor, Sixty was given the courtesy title Dowager Empress. So by this point, the empress had become quite adept at manipulation, palace intrigues, and power games. Through forged evidence and false testimony, she engineered the arrest of the eight ministers, three of whom were later executed. With the Regency Council gone, the empress became the de facto regent for the duration of her son's reign, until his early death from smallpox in 1875. The empress was instrumental in the succession, choosing her young nephew Zetian, who was crowned as emperor. So so once again, this dowager empress acted as regent to the infant emperor, this time in a more formal capacity. Twelve years into the young emperor's reign, our empress moved to the summer palace in Beijing and surrounded by a network of informants and advisors, doted on by loyalists and conservatives in the bureaucracy and military, she continued to exert enormous influence on appointments, policies, and matters of state. Stories of the empress's extravagance are prevalent, since it has been claimed that she regularly increased her personal and food allowances, uh, that she withdrew gold and silver from dwindling national reserves and spirited millions of pounds offshore into bank accounts in London. Other tales of her exorbitant spending include her decision to spend 10 million silver teals, uh, some set aside to rebuild the Chinese navy, on the renovation of one of her palaces. Another rumor claims that 3,000 ebony boxes were needed to restore her jewelry collection. Number one, Agrippina the Younger. So Julia Agrippina, also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was a Roman empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances to the future emperor, Galba, who showed no interest in her and was devoted to his wife. On one occasion, Galba's mother-in-law gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. She was one of the most prominent women in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, functioning as a behind-the-scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via, you know, the powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession, and Claudius became aware of her plotting, but died in 54 and it was rumored that Agrippina uh, poisoned him. She exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was killed. Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. And that brings us to the end of our time, and I'm glad that, you know, even though I'm part vampire queen, I just bully people. I swear I don't execute folks for fun, and not just because I'm not allowed to. Draining people of their redness, though, hell, that's another story.